Hi there, my name is Denny, and welcome to the Speak Dicely podcast, the show where I get together with other tabletop enthusiasts and we speak dicely together. It's likely that you or someone you know has a natural talent for something, a talent for art, music, mechanics, or linguistics, as a few examples. How is it that some people can be so good at something without having to put in as much effort as other people? Some say talents are their calling. It's within their being. It's in their blood. But what if that natural talent was the use of powerful magic? What if you had magic naturally coursing through your veins? Well, then you'd be considered a sorcerer. And for today's discussion of the sorcerer class, I'm joined by Michael Piscitelli and Sokoler. Hey there, folks. Uh. Hello. <laughs> how's, how's things going today? Um, all right. As, uh, I'm pretty good here. Hey. I woke up 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know. I'm joined by the the night crew today. Absolutely. Best crew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you guys are Something both happened. working night jobs now. Oh, I didn't know you were also doing that. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, we yeah. didn't talk about this previously. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah. I work it every four weeks. I switch from day to night. So I get thrown around a lot. <laughs> I, ju- I just started a job where I do night shifts like last week. So I'm still kind of adjusting to, you know, sleeping during the day. <laughs> yeah, it helps to uh, cover the blinds completely. I've learned. I live in a basement apartment at the moment. So there's a very small, big enough for me to actually get through, you know, because safety. But yeah. it's it's small enough that it doesn't get very much light to begin with, so it's not terrible. Nice. And in a vain attempt to try and fit in with this crew, I woke up at quarter to five this morning for my work, too, so I am also a nighttime guy. <laughs> yeah, that works. I, I wouldn't exactly call 5 a.m. a nighttime thing. but It was yeah, dark sure. when I started. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> less dark than light right now it's gonna count for some right yeah yeah uh but uh today we're we're talking about sorcerers and i'm i'm like now thinking in my brain i'm like how am i gonna tie sorcerers to nighttime i don't know anyway let's let's brute force transition shadow sorcerer yeah shadow uh, sorcery that's hey, that 100% yeah. of the thing all right I've we mentioned shadow sorcerer. oh perfect so th- th- michael this is all meant to be This is our segue. (laughs) This was not as finesse as I think it is. (laughs) Actually, I I was thinking about it during work the other night, and I've played five separate sorcerers since I've started playing D anD. d Oh wow! I feel outclassed. I played one. Okay, granted, (laughs) two of them were uh, storm sorcerers, but. Oh, still, we don't we don't talk about them. Oh, what? Why do we not talk? Mm, okay, we're a sore point for me. <laughs> uh, you know what? That you had, I totally forgot about a storm sorcerer I'd played. So thank you for reminding me that that class exists. I'm, you know what? <laughs> we but we better get into this before we get into this. If you got what I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> All um, right. So to kind of kick off our prompts for this discussion of the sorcerer class, what? is a sorcerer they are magic incarnate they are the people who uh walk down the street they are superheroes essentially uh that that's actually a way i've i've thought of uh looking at them um because uh, i know danny you have gripes with uh the classes that are the uh, learned learn spells um who put that info out who did that <laughs> who's the rat <laughs> um but uh, I think I think they're actually really the sorcerers are my favorite class. Like I, if it wasn't obvious at this point, um, I consider them to be the. I have I the how do I put this? Whenever you're able to make a sorcerer, you can make someone who essentially would be an adventurer if you really wanted to. Because, like, theoretically, all of them have very, very specific, very niche powers, which is what a sorcerer is. is. They, they are a niche character that are able to do a thing very, very well. Um, like storm sorcerers are able to zap things a lot. 
for example. <laughs> it looks I can't I, I can't even yet. Oh man. <laughs> we're not there, we're or, not there. Or in the I case do like of the Shadow Sorcerers, idea, they can see in the dark and cause problems for everybody on the battlefield, including their teammates. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've never thought about me being superheroes before because I, I mean, yeah, it makes sense. Like, you know, the whole gets hit by gamma rays, right? For mm-hmm. yeah. So, I mean, yeah, like they, you're literally just having something quote unquote magical happen to you and it causes you to have powers. So that's actually a really good analogy for it. Yeah. I, it's, I, I, I like that you brought up this example because I'd always thought of the class more like mutants, uh, mm-hmm. not not quite like transmutating and transforming or anything like that. But it X-Men. is, yeah, X-Men, exactly. Yeah. It is power. So I guess they're superheroes. But yeah, it's power from <laughs> their genetics that causes them to have some random power. And and I'll get into some examples in a little bit here. But yeah, this is exactly what I I agree with your assessment, Mike. Yeah, and it's not even necessarily genetics. Like sorcerers can get their powers from any from anywhere, like uh, from a bloodline or from exposure to another plane of existence. Um, you know, spending too much time in a graveyard, uh, deciding to stare at the sun. Uh... Um, I now I want to make a blind sorcerer. I, I was about to ask Michael, how many sorcerer character ideas do you have on the burner? <laughs> <laughs> too many. <laughs> I I only have six spots on D and D Beyond, and I'm constantly reusing that sixth one because I have five other characters that I. Well, I guess I could get rid of one of them if I really wanted to because I haven't played that character since like November of last year. But. <laughs> um, Dang. Yeah, I'm a little sad about it because it was it was a very fun campaign. Um, I'll get I'll get more into it when we start talking more about the individual characters. But uh, yeah, I have a a fair. <laughs> A fair amount of uh, back burner ideas that I just never get to do. But don't we all? Oh. Isn't, that, isn't, that, isn't that something that everyone who's like semi obsessed with D&D does? It's just like makes characters forever without ever actually getting a chance to use them. Or is that just me? Oh, God, that's just me, isn't it? No, no it's no. no. I have like 30 characters on D&D Beyond, um, but oh. I try not to talk about that. I just don't have so many sorcerers. I think I have like three sorcerers that are like kind of ready ish but yeah sorcerers are sick though Metal oh, magic man yeah in in terms of sorcerers is there anything else we can kind of identify about them that makes them like a unique class well i mean you just kind of just brought one up there meta magic yeah yeah i mean they can literally shape the magic to be different than it's supposed to be which is really good in certain situations especially it's Funny you mentioned shaping magic, like, uh, because I always think about the fireball, uh, sculpt, sculpt spell, sculpt spell, yeah. And I'm and compared to to the transmutation, is it transmutation? Uh, the evocation wizard. Evocation, that's it. Evocation, yeah. Um, evocation wizard's ability to shape spells is better by a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the wizards being better than every other class. What? That's new to D anD. d um, although, the, so the way, so for those at home, the way uh, we'll get in more into the magic magic later, but um, for comparison, for comparison's sake, uh, wizards let you essentially completely ignore the damage from a fireball uh, as an evocation wizard, versus the sorcerer. They just let you succeed on the saving throw, which is a very different, which is a very big difference. <laughs> well, you know, and kind of taking that and. Uh kind of uh, adding on to what what makes sorcerer's magic feel a bit different is sorcerer magic is a bit more volatile and a bit less under the sorcerer's control. Like that Mm -hmm. seems to be a common bit of flavor with sorcerers is that they have this power that manifests and then suddenly they're going, oh, I'm so powerful and I'm destroying the world around me. Help somebody, please. Or, oh, I'm so powerful and I'm a sheep. (laughs) So it's basically the protagonist of every anime. Yeah. Pretty much. You okay. are the anime. <laughs> Haven't watched much anime, so I, if I find someone with that, I'm sorry. I mean, you're you're right. The, I, I just figure they all right. have some sort of power and it kind of ruins everything and then fixes everything somehow, you know? 
that's that's also just a generally major uh, storytelling trope. True. Yeah. Pretty common. Well, since uh, since we're talking about kind of um, characters that are sorcerer like. Are there any like specific media pop culture characters that you think fit this description of a sorcerer? Yes. I mean, we just said superheroes earlier, right? I Elsa mean, Elsa from Frozen. She is oh the gosh. epitome of sorcerer. Like she's born with her magic. She is not able to control it. She doesn't quite know where it came from. And it just kind of happens whenever she eventually kind of figures it out. But like, I guess I guess spoilers for the second movie if anyone's ever seen it, <laughs> not seen it yet. Uh, she does and eventually figure it out, but like, yeah. Uh, and then she's no longer no longer queen and living as an ice spirit. <laughs> I can't believe you have ru- ruined Frozen Two for me. I was gonna get yeah. there eventually. It's Wait. on the list, like. 63rd but you know <laughs> i mean there. this is this is a, it's a kind of a major spoiler but like there's a whole bunch of other things that happen there is a lot of very nice songs in that in that movie i will say <laughs> oh yeah um, I've, I've heard the soundtrack is pretty rocking <laughs> <laughs> not literally but she's got she's got like two she's got two songs in it and like the second the second one starts off as a ballad and gets like really upbeat and peppy like it's so much it, it yeah anyway um yeah that was the major one that i was most looking forward to mentioning um you've got a, a couple on your list that you've well, given us any well um, I'll, well I'll, I'll go i'll pass it over to soko before i go into anything on my list because he, he might have things that i'd written down i was gonna say i have one that i think people would think of the nicholas cage movie sources apprentice right yeah oh. not really a sorcerer because they have a book yeah so mm, i mean yeah, but like his his magic is ar- arguably also pretty volatile. Like, yeah, but I mean, wizard's magic can still be volatile as well, though, right? I'd like not I'd, not being able to control it is just more of a magic being dangerous sort of thing. I think. Yeah, I'd, more I'd so seen, than just being like a sorcerer class. I'd seen some people arguing that uh, Mickey Mouse in that version of the Sorcerer's Apprentice is more of a um, a sorcerer. Because he, he kind of just picks up the hat and the gloves and he's just like, all right, I'm going magic now. Like, mm. hadn't been doing anything beforehand, but he's just like, okay, it's coming natural now and everything's going to hell. That'd make more sense. Yeah, I can see that. Alternatively, it's a hat of the archmage that has a uh, animate object spell go completely haywire. Yeah, yeah, it's all it's all just it's all just magic items. Yeah. Yep. He doesn't know. He's an apprentice. He doesn't know what he's doing. Um, do you have any other ones, Soko? I'm trying to think, but I mean, superheroes cover most of the ones I normally think of, I think. Yeah, like all of the X-Men. Those, yeah. Every single one of them are sorcerers. There's a... Uh, oh, gosh. There's an anime that I watched a little while ago that has this really weird name. I It's long and convoluted, like most animes. Uh, anyway, the whole concept of it was that there was some sort of like bio. Oh, My Hero Academia. Oh, pff, yeah, those are all sorcerers. Interesting. And like, and like all of the, all of their powers are stupidly uh, volatile, and they have to spend years figuring out how to use them properly. Um. In. In a example of. Kind of a reversal of what people might think. Um, the Sorcerer Supreme, Doctor Strange in Marvel, not a sorcerer in my opinion. Yeah, that's all learned magic. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the reverse side of that, every wizard in Harry Potter is actually a sorcerer. Even yeah. though they're going to school to learn magic, they're going to learn how to control magic. Because like Harry Potter in the first movie, we see that like the male's going crazy. Like weird things are happening at the Dursley's house. He's able to talk to snakes. Like, well, I mean, that's Harry specifically, but this is kind of true for a lot of the characters. Like they're like the reason that there's mud bloods and stuff like that, like implies that there is kind of a heritage passing on of magical ability. Yeah. Some, and in the case of some families, 
in in general in D and D world, that could be a thing where it's a it, everyone there's one person in the family or everyone in the family, and it's weird to not be. Isn't uh, Christie's character uh, in the Dicely campaign <gasps> is spoilers. Well, I mean, she clearly exhibits behaviors that are not matching her family's style of magic. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, it's it's written down in the the character sheet notes. So yeah, of course, she's a level of sorcerer. <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought that was I thought that no, was common. it. It is public knowledge. You're fine. You're fine. Okay, I'm just giving if you. If you like seeing sorcerers, check out that campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Soko. Huh. Oh boy. Um. And then, yeah, the last one I've got is the White Witch from the line The Witch in the Wardrobe. I never would have thought oh, yeah. of that one. I'd completely forgotten about that franchise. Yeah, I mean, it's because there's so many more books, and I'm mad they only did that one. Anyways. Uh, hmm. They did, like, three movies, I did thought. They? Yeah. they did, like, a couple after, but they weren't any good. Yeah, like, they did Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which I, like, didn't watch i read the book i like the book a lot yeah watch it <laughs> they, they always ruin the books that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> maybe it. maybe there'll be something in the near future where they'll turn it into a tv show instead and give it the proper attention it deserves I let's hope like that's the case with a lot of books is that they need to just be a tv show mm-hmm. yeah i mean they've started doing that with the um Oh dear, I don't remember the franchise for the Golden Witcher. Compass. The Witcher, the oh. Golden Compass. Uh, they're doing. They're Lord done of the with Rings Shadow now. and Bones as mm-hmm. well. Yep. Well, well, I've read the I read the books too after seeing the show. God, I love it. Um, you need to talk to Christy then. So many questions about that. <laughs> mm. I do because I need to talk to someone about it. Anyways, <laughs> she she will be very excited she, to talk to any. Actually, those books are really good though. That they would be sorcerers, no. Does the Grisha know, come with innate them. powers? Well, Did I'm pretty they? sure they're born with like an innate power and it doesn't necessarily tie through bloodline, but like randomly. And the way they find out if you're Grisha is if they test you, they have to like, you get hurt without knowing you're going to be hurt. And like the surprise of it scares the magic to show them. I, at that part, I kind of skipped over a little bit. But um, yeah, I'm pretty sure all the Grisha in that show would be considered sorcerers because it's like an innate ability. That they're born with. Well, I think for the most part, that meets the sorcerer criteria. So I guess they would. No, pretty much our our criteria is: Do you know where your powers are coming from? No, cool, you're a sorcerer. (laughs) (laughs) Either that, or you're dumb. True. Also possible. Well, (laughs) intelligence is my dumb stat. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but isn't it for everybody except uh, except wizards or artificers? Yeah. Isn't it for everybody? <laughs> it's hard not to make it a dumb stat. I will admit. Oh. Well, I usually it's strength. Proof. I usually play the like scrawny person who can barely lift themselves, let alone other things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Those are probably the two most popular dump stats. Um, yes. Imagine not dump statting decks, dude. Yeah. Terrible. I've done that. It's rough, but I, oh boy, is yeah. it different? Um, it's not fun. <laughs> No, that I, sounds uh, awful. Absolutely, do it, do it. Just up, make sure you up your con a lot. <laughs> make sure you're playing someone that can wear heavy armor. Yeah, get some plate or mail. Rain, You'll be fine. And not a ranged attacker. Yeah, not a ranged attacker. Yeah. It, mm. Um, spellcaster might be the way to go for that. Speaking of ability scores, though, uh, let's move on to a bit of the mechanics of the uh, the sorcerer class, like what. It, what all sorcerers are going to get. Um, If you want to be an effective sorcerer, the books recommend that you make charisma your highest ability score. It'll be the score that your spellcasting uses. And they recommend constitution should be your next highest score. And I feel like they did this because they're just like, nothing else is actually really important. So you might as well just have some life. I mean, you have a D6 hit die. So, I mean, you're never really going to have a ton of hit points. That's not a bad idea. Maybe take like a tough feat to kind of, you know, give you a little extra boost but you could also do decks for the higher um deck save uh well not that just armor class in general Mm -hmm. so because if you're taking less hits you know you don't necessarily need the hp per se yeah but 
it's, it's kind of a toss up between which you prefer, I think. There's a character that I played. He was a chef. Um, and I've specifically made him to have as much HP as possible. Ooh. So, um, so he was a hill dwarf who gets a Ooh. extra, who gets a extra HP, uh, Dracon, uh, draconic bloodline who mm-hmm. also get extra HP. Uh, and they also get, uh, later levels. Uh, we'll talk about this more. They get, uh, AC boost, um, and a high con stat and the tough feet. So, Per level, I think they ended up getting an extra before before con and before dice rolls. I think they got an extra five HP. Dang! Literally That's getting you your whole hit that. dice. Yep. <laughs> got barbarian level HP. Yeah. That is oh. how you do it. And that's um, before con. And that's before con or the dice. Yeah. That's just that's just bonuses. Jesus. Um and. Unlike a lot of the other episodes we've <laughs> done on classes, um, we'll actually cover some of the uh, the material that got added in Tasha's Culture of Everything. Because oddly enough, this is a very short class to go through. Otherwise, so we've we've got the time to kind of pad this thing out. <laughs> I'm okay with this. I I love you. I love those extra uh, classes or subclasses that were made because they arguably the vanilla like wild mage dra- draconic uh lineage uh sorcerer i think are kind of boring um mostly because i played them and i i granted they were early characters that i played uh so i kind of forgot about some of their abilities uh, but they were just kind of eh to me <laughs> well wild magic i feel like is the, the the subclass you play when you really just want something random that can screw up your campaign and it's fun yeah Especially if you're, I mean, I would say the only reason you should really play Wild Magic Sorcerer is if your DM is willing to do like one of those like D100 roll tables for your net one Wild Magic Surges. Because and, that's what makes playing Wild Magic Sorcerer fun. In my and opinion. And if they're willing to do it as often as possible. Like, yes. And they, and they remember. That, because that's part, that's part of the problem is that if the, D, if the DM forgets and if you forget, then it just doesn't happen. <laughs> well, if we're going to talk about subclasses, let's get right into this then. So, yeah. <laughs> first level, we get our spell casting, and then you also get your sorcerer or sorceress origin, which is your subclass choice. You get that right away, which makes Super sense. Nice. It's yeah, this wouldn't make sense if you gained it at a later point. Um, so, oddly, this class only has seven options, which I feel like is is the fewest out of all the classes. Um, they've, I mean. It very well could be wrong. I, that's just a general statement. Um, I think you're right. Of, it it kind of lends itself though for people to do their own homebrew. Like uh, I actually thinking about Elsa before. I wanted to make an ice sorcerer, and I had uh, a whole list of things like for my research that I had saved. And it was just like I think there was like twelve different pages I'd had saved trying to do research on like what other people had done and like trying to figure out the ideas that I had made and trying to mesh them together to make something that I liked, but uh, I never got very far with it. Um, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I, I don't know how you'd really do an ice sorcerer. The problem would become with the abilities, right? Yeah. Better yeah. balance, like, anyways. Like, I, I thought about having... Because I, I used Elsa as, like, my, my base inspiration. I thought, okay, what if I they made... Uh, a buddy made of ice and like they were like a snowman or an ice sculpture or something similar to that um and i thought okay but uh, what happens after that maybe they have some sort of like snowy aura that that surrounds them that they can activate or it just happens uh what well, like randomly that I mean, like slows down your your enemies who come too close to you or something like that the, the easiest way to homebrew is just, like, look at the different abilities of the other subclasses and just reflavor them to be ice. Like, I'm pretty sure the Shadow Magic Sorcerer gets, like, an animal, a Shadow Hound or something like that. That's, like, yeah. that'd be a perfect thing oh, to yeah. replace with a snowman. Um, I don't know of any other one particularly that has some sort of aura thing. Maybe the Divine Paladin Soul. I think one. they have an explosion of some sort. Um, but let's let's get through these. Let's focus. All right. Player's Handbook. 
we have the Draconic Bloodline, and we've got the Wild Magic, which we talked a little bit about. And because we have a little bit more time because of the shortness of this class, we'll come back and talk about these if we want to. Um, Xanathar's Guide to Everything gave us the Divine Soul, Shadow Magic, and Storm Sorcery. And then Tasha's Cauldron of Everything gave us the Aberrant Mind and the Clockwork Soul. And you gain subclass features when you choose this at first level, and then again at 6th, 14th, and 18th levels. So let's talk about the Draconic Bloodline. Mm. So I played a character. His name was uh, Chef Frederick. Uh, his whole shtick was that he had a crap ton of HP, and he used fire, and lots of it. Um, he also ended up... Uh, exploding a church because the uh had pr the priest there uh insulted his cooking um and then it fa and then they found out that there were myconids living in down below and, and using their spores to control the minds of the townspeople so i accidentally ended up uh <laughs> freeing the town from uh spore control okay uh so but uh, uh I, I do apologize. Let's try and limit the character stories. Let's talk about the subclasses specifically. We've got a section for those those subclasses right. or for the storms. Um, so, as I mentioned before, uh, draconic sorcerers get an HP boost and an a AC boost uh, when I think the AC boost comes at the same time at first level. I believe so. Yeah, uh, it's thirteen plus your dex mod at first level. Which is yes. really nice, especially if you only get like, even if it's the 16 dex mod, I mean, that's 16 AC that you'll have. Yeah, it's basically you get mage armor for free, like mm -hmm. without having to do anything. You just exist and you have mage armor. Um, Which is a valuable spell slot you don't have to spend. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I believe later on you also, uh, so your, your, the mage armor ability is your dragon scales uh, manifesting themselves uh, from your, your draconic lineage. Um, so like, how have you got, have, have you, have any of you ever, ever played Draconic Sorcerer? I I've, haven't. I've seen them played and in, in my campaign world, they have like significant lore. Um, so I know about them, but I haven't played one. Okay. Cause my question was, um, it did, did those characters just like have an ancestor who just banged a dragon and just like, oh. Hey, look, you have you have dragon powers now. These damn bards. The, one answer was uh, one ancestor was a bard. The other was a dragon. Yep. I have had a buddy who played a character just like that. Yeah. <laughs> the bard or the, or the dragon? Both. <laughs> um, <laughs> he likes tropes. Uh, we'll keep Apparently. we'll keep that there, but I don't know. I think the coolest part about the draconic bloodline is that you get the wings. I mean, yes. who doesn't love to be able to fly? It's a shame though that you don't get it until like fourteenth level. Yeah, it's fourteenth. Yeah. It's a really late game thing, but like, it's cool. Um, right, character story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to get into it. I'm just, I'm just gonna leave oh, it there. I know you're so excited. Oh. But I have so much to say about sorcerers. <laughs> but yeah, another thing I like about this is like, it doesn't have to be like that example of somebody in my family banged a dragon. Um, it could be kind of like, uh, you know, Dragonheart, the movie with um, uh, Sean Connery as the voice of the dragon. Oh, yeah. yeah. And he, That's all he like gave a piece of his heart to save like a dying prince. And it's like something like that could have happened, like a blessing of some sort or a literal just rip off that movie and take that idea. Yeah, or your character survived a dragon attack and was partially hit by the breath weapon, and instead of dying, it infused you with their power. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that AC bonus we were talking about, it, that comes from like the character having like some scales developing in place of their skin. So it's kind of like mm -hmm. a, a, a bodily mutation. Mm -hmm. More X Men. Yeah, exactly. That's I actually the Dragon that X Men, man. <laughs> That's something that Tasha's uh, mentioned when creating a sorcerer is a, a mark of sorcery that we'll we'll probably get more into later. That indicates, hey, you're magic. <laughs> Turn the witch. No, no. 
It's not to me. Uh, it's tattoo. Yeah. Uh, that's actually something else that uh, draconic sorcerers get is uh, not tattoos, but uh, resistance to uh, certain energy types, depending on what their dragon ancestor was. That's right. Um, yeah. For resistance. The, they do, however, have to spend a sorcery point in order to use that resistance. Um, it, it's kind of similar to the Absorb Elements spell. Um, except, I believe, Absorb Elements lets you add a d6 of that energy type to whatever your next melee attack is. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't remember off the top of my head if a Sorcerer gets the same thing. I don't, re- thinks- I don't believe it does. No. Which is a shame. It really does feel like a worse version of Absorb Elements. Yeah. <laughs> to, yeah. To need the sorcery point and only have one particular element you could do it with. It's, eh. it's rough. But if you're against a dragon of the, or some other elemental being of that kind, you're golden. Yeah. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like that kind of, though, faces the same problem that this will be a later episode, but that Rangers, as written in the player's handbook, had. You had to like talk to the DM and be like, uh, what's going to happen? Like, what, are we going to be in the mountains? Or is, is there going to be red dragons or is it going to be blue dragons? Yeah, you had to get real specific about that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah the, the revised ranger that they that they had. So much better. And, and the one that Tasha's so much better. Yeah. yeah. Oh, let's hop on over to what is, I assume, probably the most popular sorcerer class. Wild magic. I don't know Super if it's thematically cool. cool. <laughs> They're um, so Wild Mage and Clockwork Soul are like opposite sides of the same coin. Um, where Wild Magic is all about giving advantage and disadvantage, whereas Clockwork Soul is taking their power is taking away advantage and disadvantage. Um, which I thought was very cool because one is order and one is chaos. Yeah. Um, but uh, wild mages get their wild magic surge at first level, uh, where when they, as written, when they are casting a spell at first level or higher, uh, they'll uh, they roll a d20 before. Uh, I think it's like just just after or just before. I'm not. I don't remember exactly. Um, but uh, they roll a d20, and if it's a nat one, something happens. Oh boy. Will it be fireball centered on yourself, or will it be summoning a unicorn, or how about turning into a potted plant? Or, or someone gets poisoned. Um, yeah, the wild magic table's super cool. Probably, it's my only reason I'd play a sorcerer. I'm a wild magic sorcerer. Mm-hmm. Just yeah. like chaos. The, yeah. Um, and going back to that, uh, giving and taking advantage and disadvantage. Um. Uh, they get something called Tides of Chaos at the very, at first level, where uh, I think it's like once per short rest or once per long rest, uh, you can give advantage or disadvantage to another creature or yourself uh, for a dice roll. But when you do that, uh, you uh, regain or you have to roll on your uh, wild magic dice table, or I might have something... I might have this mixed up a little bit. I, it, the DM can make you do it, I think. Yes. It's a DM yeah. choice thing. It, you know what? I'm glad you brought this up because I'm realizing Christy has had this power this entire time, and I've got to point this out to her. Because uh, th- this <laughs> is the thing. If you feel like you haven't been chaotic enough, you just have to go, uh, DM, I'm going to take advantage here. And the DM goes, all right, I'll make you roll on the table at some point. And if they do, you get to you get the opportunity to roll with advantage again, and the DM can make things chaotic again. It's just this s- cycle of vicious it's so good. chaos. And um, this is why I always have a hard time playing with wild mages because we always forget about both of these abilities. They're their freaking first level ability, and we always forget. I I thought it was a second level thing, but that that doesn't make sense. That's not a thing, and. Like like how I play with um with inspiration, like I try and give it out as much as I can whenever I remember, because I keep forgetting about giving inspiration. Like if somebody uses this ability and they're a wild magic sorcerer in my party, I go, they go, all right, I want to roll with advantage. I'm like, all right, let's roll on the table now. 
I don't care. Um, I think later on you get more chaos abilities. Like, uh, ooh, it has been so long. I don't remember what their sixth level ability is. Uh, it's called Bend Luck. When uh, another creature you can see makes an attack roll, ability check, save the roll. You can use a reaction to have a D4 penalty to their roll. And you could do so after they roll, but before the effects happen. Well, it could be a benefit, bonus or a penalty. Oh, it doesn't right. have to be just penalty. But yeah, you spend two sorcery points for it, which is kind of big. Yeah, yeah. especially at level six. Like, like, that's, like a third, that's a third I, of all your your points. I feel like the sorcerer, like the features, shouldn't touch the sorcery points. Like that should just mm -hmm. be meta magics and spell slots use. Yeah, they already well, get used up so quick. I mean, well, like to be fair though, you can get more. So, meta magic, you can convert sorcery points into spell slots and spell slots into sorcery points. That is fair. Um, so, like, if you really need more points, you can just use a spell slot. Yeah, but if you need the spell, I mean, that, that's the thing is like it's trying to find that balance. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It'd be nice well, just to have that feature, you know not use sorcery points and just be limited to like, oh, you can only use this once per long rest or whatever. Maybe, think, maybe Bend Luck is more powerful that it requires that, but I, I haven't gotten that high in the class. I mean, they got a free it, advantage. I'd say that's higher than a D4 bonus. It might also have to do with uh, trying to keep tra uh, having to uh, take stock of all of your things that you keep have to keep track of. So like if you have six abilities and all of them have their own like once per long rest, you can use it per proficiency bonus you can use it for like charisma modifier then you have a whole bunch of like things you need to keep track of but if you only have sorcery points that you have to keep track of then it's all the ability and all the abilities tie back to it then it just kind of makes things a little bit simpler from a design standpoint i see your game i see it i see it i still don't like it yeah <laughs> i mean that's fair you don't have to like it <laughs> no i know but um, I think the next cool thing, I mean, at 14 level, you get to roll with advantage on your wild magic table, which is really nice if you don't want something chaotic to happen at the time. Yeah, if you or, want a bit more control over it. Yeah, yeah, if you're like in a political espionage campaign, you know, your wild magic might screw things up quite a bit, you know? So it'd, it'd be kind of nice to just at least be able to nerf it a little. Mm -hmm. But... Um. Yeah, and, and it's not even like you have to take the higher number either. It's like you just roll twice and choose whichever one works for you. Yeah. And then the last one is just kind of like an exploding dice. Like whenever you deal a spell's damage and then roll the maximum number on one of those dice, just choose a dice, roll it again, and add more damage. <laughs> so cool. Which... Explode, exploding dice on a sorcerer, that's great. There's yeah. a spell called Chaos Bolt, which is the Wild Mage's like, bread and butter. It's perfect for it, where you roll two d8s and a bunch of d6s, depending on the spell level. Um, and depending on what number on the d8s you roll is the damage type of that spell. And if you roll both, you can attack a separate creature with an with the spell and do it again and you and effect essentially this first level spell could end up hitting 20 creatures in a row if you keep rolling doubles on the two d8s it's time to buy weighted dice yeah <laughs> yeah, no yeah that right. spell crazy um Divine Soul Sorcerer is a cleric. <laughs> you get so many more spells. That's the hugest thing. Because you have access to the whole cleric spellbook, right? If I remember correctly. Uh, that's a great um, question. I don't actually know that. Well, they get the they get so divine souls get access to the cleric spell list and the sorcerer spell list, and they can pick from either. Right. Um, okay. So it's not quite the same, but yeah. they also get uh, an additional extra spell depending on their their uh, alignment. Yeah, I 
hate alignment. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> I think. I think for this for this particular case, it's more for where they got their powers from, because uh, the divine soul they get them they get their powers from a god or a celestial being that has decided I'm going to give you uh, a, an imbued sense of self worth uh, and make you extra special, um, like uh, arguably Jesus. <laughs> was a divine soul sorcerer <laughs> <laughs> oh that's one we forgot in the pop culture media section <laughs> that's an interesting one can sorcerers walk on water uh, yes <laughs> they can if they're the divine soul what can they really i i don't actually know oh, yeah. I got, no, no, I, water water walking is a spell that sorcerers oh, no. in general can learn that oh okay great <laughs> at least they can't transmute water into wine um uh, or why, uh, yeah yeah mm, that one's lost um <laughs> but anyways uh a, a lot of the other features are about like kind of saving yourself from misfortune like uh opportunities to heal you, i think pretty sure you got wings at some point like the yeah, dragon 14 just like the dragon yeah they're very they have a very similar like to dragon feel i feel like they're the celestial version of the draconic lineage yeah yeah i yeah. think the only difference is that your flying speed is limited to 30 on the divine soul whereas the draconic bloodline it's whatever your speed is oh dang which so. which depending on the which pretend depending on the lineage could be 25 feet as was the case with the the chef i was telling you about oh was yeah a- if you multi-class six levels into monk, monk, <laughs> we're on the same thought process here. Oh, uh, you have what sixty weird. feet from six levels? I don't know. They saw, it's something like that, but yeah, you get a lot of movement speed from monk. Mm-hmm. But uh, that would be a weird multi-class, though. Like monks it, get a crap ton of abilities as it is, and like key points a... and sorcerer points, man. Oh. Yeah. And that's so much. You'd have to have substantial wisdom decks and charisma. Oh God. Like this is, this is what I was talking about earlier about having sorcery points be the only thing you have to keep track of. Cause like monks, they have, they have their key, but they also have like a couple other abilities that they, they can do per like rest and just like so many things that can happen at any given point. Honestly, like monk, I would rather just like do as a straight class. But we're not talking about monks. We're talking. We're talking about sorcerers. That was last week's episode. Uh, you feel? I feel like I should Go check I it should out. Have... <laughs> I feel like I should know more about monks, but I seem to have forgotten everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's 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 talk about shadow magic, Michael. I feel like you're a bit more of knowledgeable about what that subclass offers. I am, uh, Denny. You have actually played with a, my uh, shadow mage. <gasps> what me? Yes. Uh, you know, in one of the many campaigns we played in. Uh, so, Datrum, he was a uh, Shadow Mage. Blade, uh, stories, blade. stories. Let's just talk about the features. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get um, to him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, he had the ability to see in the dark uh, up to 120 feet. Um, just in, like as the class feature. Like, you can just see in the dark, and it's great. You 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 have better night vision than basically every other class and creature out there um and you also get oh oh no what was the other first level thing you get the uh, darkness spell no no no. you don't get that until second. that's at third level oh, that's at third believe. level dang uh strength yeah. of the grave strength that's yes it. um so when you get hit, when you get knocked down to zero hp other than by radiant damage or a critical hit uh you can uh Roll a, a con save uh, of five plus whatever the damage was. Oh, charisma saving throw. Oh, it's charisma. Oh, even better. Um, you roll a charisma saving throw and a five plus whatever the damage was. And if you succeed, you don't go down. You stay at one HP. That is freaking sweet. Huge. Especially um, I don't think that matters what type of damage you take, though. I think it's just ruining whenever you go down. I don't see anything about a certain type of damage. So uh, uh, it, radi- Last sentence of that first paragraph. Oh, okay. I'm dumb. Radiant okay. damage. Because, yep. like, chances are you're not surviving a crit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
crits, man. Oh. And that next thing is like that shadow dog I was talking about. At the six, Hound right? of Ill Omen. Dire Wolf, man. It's you so get cool. you get your own good boy. True, you can just cuddle every night with your shadow wolf. Oh for my three sorcery points. <laughs> it's a it's expensive, but like also you get your the perfect guard dog and tracker. A five second tangent. Today at work, we normally have dog treats that we give out through the drive through at the gas station I work at. Somebody had a falcon in their lap. That's tangent sick. over. Let's talk about shadow sorcerers. What? <laughs> I know gas stations had drive throughs This is new. Um, Mine does. That's crazy. Anyways, yeah, the dog's cool. It only lasts for five minutes, though, right? Yeah. Like, it's very that, short. It, it, that's, it's a shame, but, like, also, you get a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I feel like for three sorcery points, you should at least get it for, like, an hour or something. You know, then you could actually use it to track something or... Yeah, something on I a larger the, scale. I think they wanted to avoid doing that to like in case they like stepped on the toes of the druids. Because like there are, yeah. because we talked about this in the druid podcast, uh, there are some uh, some uh, druid archetypes that let you summon a creature as a, instead of That's right. uh, doing your wild ma- mag or not wild magic in- instead of doing your wild, wild shape. shape. Yeah, that makes sense. I just you know. It just, it, I don't know. I think that's my general problem with sorcerers that a lot of their stuff just feels a little expensive for how much of it you really have. Yeah. But, but again, you can get more sorcery points, especially and it, yeah. and at higher levels, you'll have higher level spell slots. Like at the sixth level, you have third level spell. So, like, if you wanted to, you can just burn off a third level spell slot to, to be able to summon, summon your thing again. But I True. want the sorcery points now. <laughs> Yeah, it's a gratification, please. Um, <laughs> the the other features that this cl- this subclass gets is basically summed up is you could teleport from a area of darkness to another area of darkness with 120 feet. Um and so the last one is Yeah, and you can the la- the 18th level one is you take on a shadowy form and you're a shadow for a while. Resistance to all damage except for force and radiant. My goodness. Pretty nice. I've if you make it there. Far, but yeah, I was going to say, I've never had a campaign hit 18th either. So well, I've never had a, that particular sorcerer archetype hit 18th. Fair. Have, you've, you've played more than one, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. I've, I've played... I realized I've played six sorcerers and not five. Okay. Um... I, I like sorcerers, man. I feel so outmatched. You, you've got a sorcerer <laughs> problem, my friend. Maybe to the bit. <laughs> is it really a problem, though? You know? It is if no. we're talking about the storm sorcerer, apparently. Storm sorcerer. Yes. Oh. <laughs> oh, I have so much to say about this. At first level, when you cast a, le- uh, a leveled spell, uh, you gain a flying uh, as a bonus action, which I didn't realize was a bonus action for the longest time uh you gain a flying sp- speed of 10 feet and and you can use it to essentially escape from whatever it is that's in melee combat of you and uh you do not provoke opportunity attacks from that from that movement so it's basically a slightly worse cunning action from a rogue basically um but say for example hey look at that ledge up there i'm whoosh Come get me, sucker. <laughs> yeah, if you've got True. vertical movement, that's great. The only other thing you get at first level is a language. Yeah, you get primordial, um, which is not great. Um, yeah, I can't say I've ever really used primordial in a campaign. Weirdly enough, I used it a lot when I played these sorcerers. Well, that's, that's great. Nice. <laughs> I, mostly because I ended up using it as myself just being like i say this in primordial and the dm's just like they look at you weird or oh they 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 look at you and, and reply back in primordial in shock that someone else knows this <laughs> we this is arguably dead language is that just like the new trope of primordial it's just dead in every campaign though yeah it turns nice. out the rocks don't like to talk much Um, and okay. the oceans, they just wave. <laughs> oh, Six man. level. Oh, nice. 
<laughs> Six levels where I have my real gripe with the Storm Sorcerer. My first one, I should say. You gain resistance to lightning and thunder damage, which arguably are two of the least used damages in D D. Next to acid. Next to uh, yeah, but I feel like acid. A lot of people use like black dragons at least in their campaigns. I find really or at least in most of my campaigns, I've seen a black dragon over almost any other dragon. I've been I was going to say one. I usually see more like fire and ice dragons. I think we fought two in our last campaign. Two black dragons. Two black dragons. Oh wow. wow. I think. I don't know. It's it, it was a long two and a half years. Um, <laughs> you also get the ability to zap creatures uh, within ten feet of you mm-hmm. with uh, light with lightning uh, at, after you cast a first level or higher spell. Yeah, but the problem is, as a sorcerer, you don't want to be close to people in combat either. So again, it's just it's not enough distance. It should be like thirty feet. Yeah, retribution damage new. Yeah, because uh, it's just not enough. So I have this problem that I, I play char- I play melee characters who really, really should not be melee characters. <laughs> um, but then when I when I decide to not be melee character anymore, I get shat on. So whatever. Uh, <laughs> you need a blade dancer. I yeah, the, I have stories about blade singers. Love blade dancers. Um, yeah. Uh, they don't end poor. They don't end well. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, storm searchers get uh, cool. They basically just they're they're storm from X Men. They yeah. they can fly. They can just have lightning leaping up off of their bodies. Um, they can control the rain and the wind around you a little bit, which that's is cool that's, thematically. That actually is a is a thing that came up in the campaign that I played. Uh, Windy Wendy, a oh. halfling, <laughs> a half, a young halfling who uh, uh, fought Tiamat. Um, but uh, so part of that campaign, we ended up having to go to like the far north to go do uh, some sort of mission. I don't remember exactly why we had to leave, but um, we had to take a boat. And as soon as the DM had mentioned that, I just get really happy and. <laughs> So the uh, captain was like, oh, yeah, it's going to probably take like two or three weeks, depending on the wind. And I just sat there just like, no, it's not. (laughs) Yeah, a storm sorcerer would be a superb asset in a pirate themed campaign. Yeah, it's uh, so they can control uh, existing winds that are within 100 feet of them and direct them to go whatever way they want them to. Um, they can't create new wind or new weather effects, but by that point, uh, actually, no, it's later on. You can be able to cast control, control weather, but it's basically, you have the ability to just say, let's go that way. Always. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, it's cool, but you can't like alter the speed of it either, which can be rough because then if you just lose the wind. You're stuck rowing the boat, I guess. Yeah, but it is still very handy if you need to get somewhere specific and the wind is just being a pain in the butt and always being in front of you because you're trying to go that specific direction. Thank you, Sea of Thieves, for this damn anxiety <laughs> related to wind. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to be a storm sorcerer in Sea of Thieves. It'll be there you go. so much easier. Oh, that would be that would be broken. Oh, yes, let's do it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the rest of the class is mostly just like, if you hit me, I electrocute you and I can fly. So yeah, the class rounds out to be more like, yeah, storm. 18th level though is very nice oh. because you can give, you can give your ability to fly to other people up to your charisma modifier, which is, I believe better than the fly spell because it's, it lasts, it's last longer. I believe I think it lasts for an hour. Yeah, the fly spell is only 10 minutes. Also, it's even better than that. It's three creatures plus your charisma modifier. Yeah. That's a lot of people flying. It's an yeah. hour. It la- it's, if you have max charisma, it's eight characters. But it's 18th level. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's my thing. Is like, it, it's like the Storm Sorcerer just doesn't really have much until then. But by then, I mean, you know. You're Storm. 
it's well i'll just say by then you're probably fighting enemies that are going to knock you out of the air anyways so it's not like a huge yeah so the nice thing, thing about have that is that it's not concentration either true so like it's it's a hover speed it's a fly speed if you're gonna get knocked prone you're just upside down might you're still be nice actually. for dungeons yeah and attached to that 18th level immunity to lightning and thunder that's though it doesn't come cool. up as often like n- there's hardly any classes that i can think of that give you immunity to damage types yeah. very few if any like most most of them give resistance by that point and it it's a bunch of resistances but none of them give uh, almost none give full on immunity. immunity yeah I don't know. I just feel like there's so much more they could have done with the subclass to make it feel usable. Because right now, as it stands, I mean, if you're in an overland campaign, the Storm Sorcerer, you're not really going to be using much of its abilities. It's more just you're playing a sorcerer without the subclass. I I will admit, I did I did play a Storm Sorcerer in a uh, um, Curse of Strahd campaign that I was briefly a part of, and it did feel underwhelming for the little bit that yep. I was playing. And I think that's actually where my uh, dislike for known uh, for known spells classes came into play. Mm. I was just like, yeah, if you're playing a sorcerer warlock, it's kind of like, oh, they just get everything. And I have to sit here with my 11 spells at 11th level, you know? Yeah. Cool. Thanks. But well, the next two are incredible. Yeah, let's talk about the aberrant mind. Or aberrant mind? Uh, I might be pronouncing that wrong. I don't know how to say it. I think um, it's aberrant, but I don't know. It's that's basically on- the one I know the least amount of. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, it's basically you. It's basically the great old one equivalent of for sorcerer. Yeah, it's like a mind flare sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. You are gross. I don't want to touch you. Get out of my brain. Pretty much. Yeah. Coolest thing about these next two are that they get spellless that expand the spells that you know, which is huge because you don't know very many spells, and this basically doubles the amount of spells you know. Almost. Yeah, because at first level, you only know one, two two spells of first Yeah, level this adds there. three other ones. I think one's a cantrip, but you know Distant Whispers and Arms of Hadar added, so you literally double your spell list at first level just by taking this subclass, which is huge. <laughs> wow, I didn't realize this. That's great. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why I know a lot of people have been raving how this is really great for the sorcerer class because now it's like you feel like you have a lot more to do. And you get telepathy as the first uh, level uh, aberrant mind sorcerer. Yep. Yeah. But it only lasts for um, people with your mouth is a lot easier in campaigns, especially when there's like espionage and stuff like that. Yeah. How long does it last, though? It's just forever. Uh, oh, a number of minutes equal to your sorcerer level. Boo. Okay. So I guess that's good if you're like splitting the party to take out something like within a small distance. But I mean, that's unfortunate considering that the rogue, one of the rogues. Um, oh dear, which is, I think it's a. Is it mastermind? No, I'm thinking of the uh, the soul, some the soul Gavin? shard. Oh, s- soul knife. Oh, soul knife. Soul knife. Yeah, that one can do telepathy for hours. Yeah. Like depending on the dice roll. Fair enough, but longer than this. They just hate sorcerers. I guess. Confirmed. So. This is the coast. Hates sorcerers. I mean, alternatively, you just be a ghost wise halfling and just be able to do telepathy always within thirty feet. Or a Kalashtar. Yeah. Um, I'm but. seeing here that uh at sixth level. When you gain more spells from that expanded spell list, if you use if you use sorcery points on the spell, it'll automatically be a quiet spell. Like that's mm-hmm. what? Ooh. Yeah, so you don't even need like to use your sorcery points for that for your for, for that extra list, which yes. is super cool. That's, ah, and then you get some uh, resistance to psychic damage, uh, can't have more difficulty being charmed and frightened. That all makes sense for a mind-based yeah. class. Yeah. Nothing crazy, but it's cool. That being said, being able to resist be charmed and frightened is a very, very good ability to have, especially if you're like in a campaign where that happens frequently. 
Cough, cough, Logan. Cough, cough. You've been called out, Logan. No, I mean, it's a good thing, but my, uh, my only thing about that is that's a pretty common thing for a lot of uh, races to have as well. And, this- you know, a lot of people... Yeah, because, like, I mean, well, though I think the second most played race in general is elves. That's fair. So they, they all the get that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then it's not the frightened, but I think halflings have an advantage against frightened. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, it's still cool to have, right? It's an extra thing to add on, makes you a little easier to control and not have to worry so much about your, like your wisdom saving throws. Yeah. Um, uh, the 14th level ability, it's kind of, you begin to like morph into something a bit more icky. Um, or that kind of begins to manifest, I guess, is a better way to explain that. Um, so, like, you can do things by magically transforming your body for a sorcery point. Like, you can see invisible creatures. You get a flying speed. Um, you can have a swimming speed. Or you become slimy and pliable. Gross. Again, ew, don't yeah, touch the, me. Yeah, the slimy thing is... Uh... So cool. <laughs> I could, you can fit through any door. Like as long as there's like basically space, you can get through, which is huge. I mean, I, they have a magic item for that. <laughs> yeah, but like, I mean, you're the problem with magic items though is that you're not always going to get those. Yeah, yeah, and it only costs one sorcery point. That's the yeah, thing. That's, like that's these the are problem. relatively cheap things as well to spend sorcery points on. But again, what, which I this love. Fourteenth level. Yeah. Yeah. So at 14th level, you have 14 spells or uh, bleh, sorcery points. And at that point, you're at like seventh level spells. Yes. I suppose so. Yeah. Yeah. You're just before you get eighth level spells. So but, uh, at that point, you got spell slots to burn on, uh, on sorcery. Yeah. Points. But I mean, the matter. fact that you don't have to burn those spell slots on is really nice. That's yeah. the thing. Mm-hmm. They kinda, I think they kind of took that into more. Uh, Conscience, Con- consciousness. Yeah, they took it into consideration more. <laughs> consideration. There you go. That's the word. <laughs> um, and the last one at the 18th level ability is a warping implosion. By the sounds of it, I haven't given this thing a full read through, but you can teleport and then cause an explosion behind where you had left. Yeah, it's pretty oh. good too. It's strength saving throw, which is kind of nice. Oh wow. Yeah, a that odd. is not a thing that people use very often. What mm-hmm. is? Are you guys familiar with the Mass Effect games? I am. What is that uh, that bio ability where it's like uh, you you cause like a little sphere and then everybody kind of gets sucked towards it, like a black hole sort of? Oh, kind of. But that's what this is, except for you teleport from the spot and everybody gets sucked in and is like, ah, yeah, <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was going to say, because this ability sort of sounds like the uh, Summer Eladrin uh, face step ability, where you teleport and then it just boom. Mm. Kind of, yeah. Kind of a thunder step. But... Yeah. Yeah, it's the thunder step that pulls people in, which is yeah. pretty sweet. Because then, if you get them all, all the enemies grouped up, then your AoE spellcasters that are with you can just go to town. <laughs> is, that a, is that an action or a bonus action? It's an action. Okay. So it's basically it's basically your get out of jail dimension door ish sort of thing. So because oh, like if you really wanted to, you could just action do that and then quicken spell with the meta magic. And... Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. It's just like I'm gonna leave the spot, you're all gonna group together because that's what this ability does, and I am over there, fireball. Boom. That's that, rough. That is actually really great. <laughs> Yeah, that's a wonderful ability. And by that point, you have like four or five meta magic options. At least, yeah. Yeah. No, you ha- you have plenty to choose. And quick and spell, I mean, is one of the best in my opinion to take. We haven't even touched on. We haven't even like started talking about. It I know. It's like we haven't even gotten second level yet, huh? We'll get there. We'll get there. We're getting pretty close. This is the last subclass we're on now. It's the Clockwork Soul, and we did talk about this a little bit already. Yeah. So conversely to how wild magic gives advantage and disadvantage, this removes advantage and disadvantage at first level. Um, I believe it's up to your charisma modifier. Um, uh, So if, for example, you see a creature that, pardon? It's proficiency bonus. Oh, it's a a charisma modifier. But oh, even better. 
Um, so it just gets higher and higher as you go up. Mm -hmm. Um, so for example, you see something that's got, you see a friend on the ground and, uh, something's got advantage because, you know, they're prone. You just like, nope, you have, you're just a regular old attack or, um, someone has is doing like a, an ability check and they're like slipping and sliding around on grease to try and like uh stand up and, and they have disadvantage on it and it's like nope you're just gonna do, you're gonna you're fine you're gonna be okay <laughs> hopefully hopefully maybe um but they also get the expanded spell list the first level as well which is nice it's not as good as the aberrant mind spell list um yeah, what, do you, what do you get for those spells uh, you level. get alarm protection good from evil and good at first level, which are okay. Alarm's good. I like alarm. People like alarm. Um, then you get aid and lesser restoration, which are both really nice spells to have in a pinch. Um, dispel magic protection from energy, both great third level spells. Freedom of movement and summon construct, which I've never used because I'm pretty sure it's brand new to Tasha's. Yeah, the summon spells typically need a very expensive piece of equipment to as part of the material components. Um, yeah, usually. But like once you do, oh boy, is it great to have that extra creature on the battlefield? Yeah, um, yeah. that one needs Action an ornate, economy is everything. That one needs an ornate or that's tough to say an ornate stone and a metal lockbox worth four hundred gold pieces. Oof, that's that not too bad. Expensive. I mean, yeah, it's it's pricey, but that's uh, doable. Yeah, and then you get great restoration and. What I think is the bread and part of this class, Wall of Force. Yes. Definitely the best spell in the spell list. That is pretty fantastic. I mean, it's the, basically monologue the spell. Yeah. I mean, the two of them, like, who doesn't love a greater rest? Who here has never been saved by a greater restoration? Yeah, you, no one. If you play DD, greater restoration will save you. you at some have point. Been, I think in the high level campaign I'm in right now, I've been saved by greater restoration like five times in the last three sessions so. that's a lot of diamonds <laughs> yeah no kidding well, we're also level 19 in that campaign so like we can afford it but also holy crap we really need to keep stop using them <laughs> um yeah so uh moving moving on in this class like the sixth level ability is you create like a ward for yourself so it kind of gets mm -hmm. that wizard abjuration kind of feel yeah, but it's so much better, it I think. It is so much better. Like, like you, because you can choose to spend the sorcery points on it to get a number of D8s to reduce the damage by, and that lasts for an hour? It lasts until you finish a long rest or until you use this again. Oh wow. my gosh, it's even better. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, because the Abjuration Ward only lasts as long as, like, you have HP to it. But like if it if it runs out, you have to cast abjuration spells to get it back. And even then, you only get like two or three, depending on what level of the spell the spell you spend. Yeah, I mean, you could re potentially reduce damage by forty every time. Yeah, that's insane. That's huge. That's most attacks just not doing any damage to you. Yeah, until you get like high level beasties. And again, you can just keep burning off spell slots if you need to to keep yourself alive. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's Dang. a sixth level. Uh, the fourteenth wow. level. What is this here now? Oh my gosh! Mm -hmm. Rogues are infiltrating. <laughs> as as a bonus action, you enter a, a like a a lawful state for a minute. I guess is the best way to call it. And attack rolls against you can't have advantage. Whenever you make an attack roll or any roll with a d20, you can't roll lower than a nine. You treat it as a ten at least. Oh, it's like it's like an equilibrium sort yes. of deal. Yeah, yeah. Because the the Clockwork Soul is all about it, it, they get their powers from the plane of order, typically. Yeah. Um, the cannon, that that's that's the guy who runs the plane of order. Uh, yeah, and the fact that it's a bonus action is pretty sick, and you can use five sorcery points to use that again if you really need to. Yeah, which isn't that bad. Yeah, the first time is free; like you just use the bonus action, you get this ability. If you need to use it again, five sorcery points. But yeah, I mean, burning spell slots. <laughs> yeah, which is like something that a lot 
I know we've talked about it a lot, but it's something that not many people, or at least not many, I don't do it very often in my experience. It's because it's like something that everyone just kind of forgets that they can do. And they, and like, I often worry, oh man, I'm going to, I'm going to run out of spell slots. I'm not going to be able to, or I'm not going to run, run out of spell slots. I'm going to run out of sorcery points. I'm not going to be able to do all my stuff. I'm going to be dead in like five seconds. Granted, I have died on multiple occasions. So like, I, I, I have that genuine fear is you know a healthy do a healthy fear of death. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Plus, you only have a D six hit die, so I mean, you can't ever really get that many hit points. Yeah, I think I'm starting to realize that's probably why I die so often is because I only have a D six and I tend to go into melee, which is a bad idea. Yeah, that'll do it to you. Yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> And the last level ability, the 18th level ability of this uh, subclass is you summon a bunch of little construct allies, like Modrons or whatever you want them to look like. Um, the spirits restore up to 100 hit points. Oh, dang. And you can divide yeah. it amongst your friends. Oh, dang. <laughs> Any damaged objects in the cube? So I guess it's like a cube summon. Um, oh, cool. So it's like you summon a cube area. Yeah, it's a 30 foot cube. Of these little like essentially healer bots and they just go like around fixing everything nanobots oh it's a pit crew oh yep. my gosh and you can end any spell that's six level or lower inside that cube summon pit crew wow <laughs> that is that is superb yeah i mean paris an artificer that's running the battlesmith you can literally instantly repair his little bot as well as healing the rest of your team yeah like, that's some great flavor you know get a party together that's an art artificer this sorcerer the clockwork sorcerer a gunslinger like you've got a, oh my gosh a close to yes. modern setting a techno setting Ooh, that'd be a lot of that fun actually cool. the clockwork day. Old, uh, character i played he actually used intelligence instead of charisma and he fought all of his magic was technology was just his technology so like he would whenever he used his abilities he had a stopwatch as like his arcane focus and he would like like click it and be like okay you're at regular now instead of disadvantage um huh. and like he would use that to adjust uh um t essentially time around him that's a really, really cool thing. flavor i really like that <sighs> Another character right. idea I won't ever get to play. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, for, moving forward, we can kind of, we basically aside from meta magic, we can basically steamroll the rest of everything that this class gets. Like yeah. second level, font of magic. We've touched on this a lot already. It's this ability to swap sorcery points, which you get at second level, for spell slots, and to do the opposite to exchange spell slots for sorcery points to use on. Meta magic, which we'll get at the next level, as well as for these several other abilities that your sorcerer is going to get. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At second level, the you don't really use it for anything other than getting extra spell slots. Yeah. But like at second level, that's great because <laughs> you only have four. I think yeah. No three. I think you only have three. Yeah, I think no, it's you... hardly any. So. You don't even have second level spell slots, so you maybe have like three spell slots tops. Yes, it's three yeah. first level spells. Yep. Yeah. So being able to get those back with your two sorcery points is pretty nice. Well, one anyway. Or yeah, <laughs> but you know, it's that one extra cast that you that might be yeah. that saves your life. It's the one that kills the guy, you know. Exactly. Right. And moving on to third level, this is meta magic. This is the bread and butter of a sorcerer. Yeah, I mean, I think most of them are actually pretty usable, too. I, I think, like, it, depending on your campaign, obviously, and how you really want to play it. Personally, my favorite spell, or my favorite two meta magics are Subtle Spell, which allows you to cast a spell with no somatic or verbal components, which is great for kind of like the espionage sort of campaigns or political intrigue. Or a campaign where magic is illegal. <laughs> yeah, I, that's huge then. Or twin spell which makes uh, so you can target a second creature with a, a spell that normally targets one creature so like you could use hold person on two people at the same time 
instead of just the one. But it's expensive because it costs the amount of sorcery points that the level is for the spell. Yeah. So yeah. you have to be careful with that one. Yeah. We've got other things like careful spell, which we talked about earlier, is like the uh, the wizard, the evocation wizard. It's like choose a number of creatures and uh, they can choose to succeed on a saving throw where they happen to be in the area of because you're a fireballing sorcerer. And you, of course, you wanted to throw that anyway. <laughs> um. Uh, and Tasha's introduced a couple other ones like uh, transmute spell. So you take the em- do you take that energy of like, let's say you're casting uh, flaming flaming hands, flaming hands, burning yeah. hands, burning, burning hands. hands that's it. Let's say you're casting burning hands. Uh, you can change the fire damage to acid or lightning or cold. Although they did introduce a, a, a basically the cold version in uh, Rhyme of the Ice Maiden, um, but that's just a spell. Yeah. Like it, you could you could make it into pretty much. Any, they have a list of the different energy types that you can change it to, but um, it, it essentially like you're not just limited to be only being fire and area of effect. It could be lightning. Or, yeah, it's a great for overcoming resistance. Yeah. Huh, that one time fireball isn't effective. Let's make it acid ball. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty um, sure Logan had this ability in one of my campaigns and he did exactly that. And I was like, all right, I shouldn't have homebrewed this the way it was. Well, that's actually a wizard of the, uh, the order of the scribes. Yeah, uh, that's a wizard thing. But for that one, the, the spell needs to be the same level. And you need to have as what you already have, uh, and it needs to be already in your spell book. So, at first level, you just take chromatic orb. You never actually use it because it's got an expensive component to it. But you just uh, swap it out for literally everything else. Hey, that ma- that magic missile that does force. Let's make it do thunder instead. It's- oh man, dude, wizards. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Um, but anyway, um, sorcerers, the, the yeah. arguably the jock of the spellcasting community. Yeah, true. I mean, like other thing to quickly like rumble off a bunch of what other things you could do with meta magic. There are there are options that you allow you to increase the range of your spells that let you do more damage that make a spell last longer. Or um, if you're making somebody do a saving throw, you can make them have disadvantage on that. Uh, Take a, a a spell that was an action to cast, make it a bonus action, so you can get like a, a spell and a cantrip off in a turn. Um, there's so much you can do. Or like another one of the Tasha ones that got introduced, the Seeking spell. If you miss, roll again. Let's hit him. <laughs> <laughs> basically, Super nice. you had you had advantage. You basically you had regular. Now have advantage. Uh, Oh, I had a thing I was going to say. I I, I could visualize it like my every spell that my sorcerer casts is a boomerang, and it might come back. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh, that's awesome. Um, That'd be so, so great. One thing about meta magic is that the majority of them you can only use one meta magic option at a time. However, some stipulate within their own description that you can use this with another option. Um, yes, I believe. It's like heightened spell that lets you add damage or something like that. That it lets you use it with something else. The, there's like one or two. There's like one or two in there that let you use it with another option. I believe it is oddly enough. I think it's only two, and that's the empowered spell, which allows you to deal reroll a number of damage dice equal to your charisma modifier, mm-hmm. and the uh, the seeking one. Yeah. the boomerang yeah yeah only only two out of the like eight or nine i believe there are now yeah yeah uh oh ten there's ten ten which oh. isn't enough i think there should be more yeah meta magic options or options that let you use them with other options options all together mm. all options are good options yeah then, then he just always wants options forever please i do um Continuing this now barrage through the remainder of the class, there's so little, like 
two thirds of what I'm about to share here are Tasha specific. There's almost nothing. Yeah. Like you get meta magic and spells, and that's and and class features, and that's it. Yeah, or archetypes. And that's it. Yeah. So Tasha's introduced an option at fourth level that called Sorceress Versatility. Essentially, anytime you level up to a level that you can have an ability score increase, you can either replace one of your meta magic options, or you can change out one of your cantrips for another cantrip. And then fifth level was Magical Guidance, which when you fail an ability check, an ability check specifically, you can spend a sorcery point to reroll. Which is nice. Yeah. yeah it's a small thing, especially, but it could especially be... Especially if you're a character that is not very good at most things and has had terrible, terrible, terrible dice rolls for an entire campaign. What's that? You went with that low dexterity? This is going to be your friend. You can uh, open up the door now. <laughs> uh, so it's the door. Does uh, does somebody else want to cover the uh, the twentieth level ability? Oh, you just get magic. You get you just get sorcery points, right? Yeah, they get yeah, four sorcery points for a short rest. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's it's pretty underwhelming. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's very disappointing, but like, eh, eh. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It, 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 yeah, it, I'd almost prefer getting nothing. It'd make it, me feel better. I, as we're exploring each of these classes, I'm just like, man, it almost feels like they don't want you to get to 20th level. Yeah. Well, like, they've even actively admitted that, like, most, they, they're they aware most players won't make it past 10. Mm -hmm. So, like, they don't care. They didn't, I feel like they didn't care enough to be able to make something really good. Although Paladins get some pretty I'll say, yeah, there's some like, classes that have, like, awesome great end game level abilities another class that's like did you did you even like try or did you just like throw some on paper and say hey here you go have fun i mean we've been talking a lot about like game design that being said i feel as though it might be more with the, the spell the main spell casting classes like sorcerer and wizard and bard and cleric and all those guys they have ninth level spells at that point yeah. So they're they're I I feel like wizards are just like okay you you can cast two you have two ninth level spells that you might know you can cast each of them you can cast one of them once per long rest um or sh can you do a ninth level spell slot with sorcery points no it only goes up to fifth I don't level believe so yeah okay yeah so so I feel as though game design wise they're like okay they get the ninth level spells which are pretty freaking sweet like you get some really i i ha i re was really excited to cast meteor swarm in one of the campaigns and i didn't get to do it because i didn't get a ninth level slot because i was one level short oh no um, i'm right there with you dude and but oh. like i've had it used against me and holy shit Oh boy, it is powerful. It hurts. It hurts <laughs> a lot. Forty d sixes of damage. Four zero. Oh, it'd be so much fun to roll that much dice, though. Right. Oh, boy. That's probably the like, only time I would go to it, like an electronic die roller. I'd be like, I I don't have time for this. <laughs> <laughs> but you just get to blah with dice. You I blast in my own time. I just roll dice in my free time. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> I just drop them down the stairs. Anyway. So, Not the D4s, though. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Only Unless if you're an evil sorcerer. <laughs> um, so with that, we're, we're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be right back. Um, and we're going to talk about a bit about the... Uh, wow, that was a stumbly sentence. We're going to talk a bit about the roleplay aspects of the sorcerer class. So we'll see you all in a bit. Hi there! Do you have a podcast you'd like to promote? How about sponsoring an episode of the Speak Dicely podcast? If you'd like to get in touch with me about including an ad during one of our episodes, contact Denny at DicelyChannel at gmail.com. Now, back to the podcast. And hello again, everybody. Hello. Uh, well, hello, hello. <laughs> I I am once again joined by Michael and Sekolar, and we're talking about sorcerers. So, 
we're let's get into a bit more about character. Michael, this is your time to shine. So <laughs> tell us about sorcerers you've played and oh, any archetypes you've picked. So of the of the six sorcerers I've played, I've been a wild mage, which was my first sorcerer I played with uh, you, Denny, uh, Balasar, oh, Salad Bar. That's right. Um, he. Uh, he was the student of Denny's char- wizard character um, who would frequently show him up and, and went and went casting spells. <laughs> that did happen. Um, a, I played the chef character, uh, Chef Frederick, um, who was all about fire magic. Uh, I played two storm sorcerers. Uh, one was the uh, Windy Wendy, uh, the, the little halfling uh, who fought a fought a five-headed dra- uh, fiendish dragon um fun fact tiamat is a fiend not a dragon mm-hmm. um yeah because she's That's so fiend, weird right um and uh, another sorcerer uh, another storm sorcerer named uh cloud chaser uh he was a tabaxi um and uh part he was part of this campaign where uh, all the people got stuck to this other other dimension, essentially, that was constantly like shifting and changing. Um, uh, this is the character. This is one of the characters I wish I I had gotten to play again. He, the the story that was going on and like all the the inter, interwoven character shit going on it was, just, it was so much fun. Um, I played a Clockwork Soul Sorcerer, who uh, we, I mentioned earlier, who uh, he didn't think was he was magic. He thought all of his stuff was just his technology because he, he was very much, he was a tinker. He was a, uh, a gnome. Uh, he was a rock gnome uh, who you, whose arcane focus was a stopwatch that he would like twist and turn and, and uh, constantly be like having like a screwdriver making adjustments to it. Um, it like, feels very he, Doctor Who. He was, yeah, kind of. Um, yeah, because a lot of his magic was him taking out uh, mini inventions that were they they were magic, but he thought because he built them, uh, they were just like technology. Um, and then the most recent character I've played, uh, also with Denny, <laughs> was uh, Datrum, a shadow sorcerer hexblade warlock uh, combo who uh all of his magic came from the shadow fell um like all of it including his uh magic sword hexblade sword um and his uh whole sorcerer shtick was that he was covered in tattoos of animals um and when he cast a spell uh that tattoo would come to life so uh when he would use his uh uh the darkness spell he had a raccoon on like I think it was on like one of his uh, one of his arms, or no, no, he had a raccoon a raccoon tattoo on his neck, um, and the mask would move up around his eyes to signify that he could see through his magical darkness. Um, or uh, when he'd cast shield, he had an arm- armadillo uh, on like his wrist, and he'd like raise his arm, and like an armadillo shield would surround him. Um, he had many pets. That's, That's super cool. Um, his his uh, illusion magic. Uh, he had a peacock. Uh, he so he had a sleeve of of birds, and his illusion magic was a peacock. Um, and I, I I wanted there to be a point where he would be. Oh no, there was a point where he explained all of his magic to the rest of the car- the cast, and he uh, used used his his peacock magic to show all of the animals up surrounding him, like. Um, one there was a lion that was uh, all evocation magic. There was a shark that was conjuration. There was uh, you uh, a stag for necrom- necromancy, right? Yeah, because I would use uh, chill touch, and it would be like uh, in Harry Potter, uh, his Patronus comes charging forward and like hitting and like hitting in into his enemy but he's trying to figure out where that came from uh but and i named it james and he fucking missed all the time (laughs) and it would just be like the stag just like running forward and just whiffing um (laughs) 
except for the times where it did where it did end up hitting like uh, against there was a troll that we fought um and chill touch part of the spell is that they can't regain hit points at, until the end of my next turn uh so i would use i use that and it would and i flavored it that the stag would like have its have its um uh, horn antlers or its antlers just like digging into it just like constantly like moving with with the troll um and uh yeah i really this is this is why i really like sorcerers because they're so weird that their magic can manifest as any and that's that's kind of why i equate them to like the x-men and superheroes because like um that spell list that you have those are their powers like yes you have all of your, the abilities as a, as a sorcerer like uh like as a shadow sorcerer yes you can see in the dark yes you can cause darkness to appear but your spells are all of your extra are all of your like minor abilities that you have like um i don't know wolverine his whole his whole shtick is that he has he, he has the claws but he's also got his healing factor so like for example divine soul sorcerer can have cure wounds as one of their spells as well as their their ability to use 2d fours to influence uh, uh an ability roll or, or check or whatever that they make that they make um so that that's why i kind of equip, equate them to they 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 have superpowers as opposed to being this magical utility box that a wizard is with wizards are utility utility sorcerers are talent Yeah. Get up to show us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're they're the magical jock of the of 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 the. I think there's a there's a Strixhaven school thing that they're that uh, Wizards of the Coast is trying to make. Um, recently, though, so they they had an Unearthed Arcana that came out where it was different colleges of this magical university where it was multiple spell casting uh classes got their their magic from so druids wizards and sorcerers would be part would potentially be part of one college focusing on something uh or but then there's druids clerics and bards being part of another college ultimately they decided apparently people hated this idea which is bonkers to me because I thought it was a fantastic idea. Um, so they're not going with that anymore, and oh. I think they're going with something else in favor of, it, of in, instead of the whole mixing classes to be able to have the same fe- the same features, but like happening at slightly different times to match up with how they get them as part of their archetypes. Um, I have a whole tangent about the Strixhaven thing that I, I could go on about how I would love for them to keep doing what they were doing with the Unearthed Arcana. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> well. Soko, have you played any sorcerers yourself? I have. I've actually played a Divine Soul Sorcerer. And the way I'd kind of play it is that he wasn't actually summoning like magic from himself. He'd basically bring like a planetar over th- from like the plane of his god or whatever. I, I forget exactly how I'd function that. And the planetar would do everything for him. But like he's the only one that could see the planetar. Everybody else just thought he was doing it. Oh. So he thought he was going crazy. Have you? He was like ever, super paranoid. Have you ever played the Persona series? I haven't. Okay. Oh. You would really like it then. Um, I do know a bit about Joker just because of Smash Bros, but that's about it. Of course. So, yeah. So in the, <laughs> the Persona series, um, every person has, so it's, it's particularly in Persona 5, every person has like an inner representation of themselves that is what uh... they truly, what they really are. Um, so in Persona 5, uh, the characters, it's their inner rebel. Um, so they're represented by like famous figures in history. So like uh, Captain Kidd and, um, uh Milady Dark, I believe is what her name is from uh is, 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 she was some some French rebel or uh Carmen from the opera Carmen. Um 
and like and people like that and they manifest uh when they the, when they're when they're summoned behind behind the person that they represent and they that's where their magic comes from uh so they're able to cast like elemental spells or like do cool like uh physical hits and like like firing off guns and things like that um one one character in particular she's it, it she has a persona called Milady that uh it, she's just like this very elegant uh woman doesn't have she's missing her head but she she has like a, a mask and a fan and this big ball gown that when it opens up reveals an arsenal of like machine guns rockets and like all sorts of other artillery <laughs> It's really cool. Jesus. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, because your your solar ability has reminded Michael of the ball gown wielding several machine guns. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, like, dif- uh, go ahead. The difference between the, these though is that people, other people, are able to see them, uh, and obviously your character, no one else could see them, and you you just thought you were going insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he's like. I don't actually do anything, guys. There's this other guy that just comes to help me. Like, I'm not here. He, he's doing everything. And he eventually figured out that he wasn't going crazy. But it was a <laughs> lot of fun to play. Really paranoid guy that doesn't know what's going on. Yeah. But. I think that's that's a great concept, though. Just to have, like, yeah. I am a normal person and I have a friend yeah, you guys are the crazy ones. You guys are blind. Not my fault. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure the only sorcerer I've played is that storm sorcerer I was talking about, the uh, the dwarven one. And yeah, I was just so underwhelmed by the class, so I think mm. it left a bit of a sour taste in my mouth after mm. after having played it. Um, but I've played alongside several sorcerers, like the one you pointed out there, Michael, with the um, the all the tattoos. Uh, my buddy Jason, who himself is an agent of chaos, played a wild magic sorcerer, and of course, unicorns and potted plants and fireballs galore. So that was that was fun to witness. Um, but yeah, I I've never picked up the class after that first time, but I I think I would like to try it again. If I had to give a recommendation for like the three that I think are the most worth playing, uh, this is based off my own opinions. I really like the aberrant mind. Clockwork Soul and the Divine Soul. Mm-hmm. I mean, those are like my top three. Um, just because I like the expanded spell lists, especially those really help. And thematically, they're just my favorite. Yeah, if if I had to pick three, it would be at least Clockwork Soul and uh, Draconic Lineage, um, and and honestly, the Shadow Soul. Or the shadow sorcerer, like there, that one's pretty cool. Especially, especially if you decide to play a character that doesn't have dark vision to begin with, um, like a dragonborn, for example, <laughs> uh, or a human. Uh, and then the clockwork soul, that the character I, I described earlier that doesn't think that it's it's magic. I thought I, that, that was just a fun idea that I just wanted to roll with, and um, yeah, it's like it's almost like being an artificer without being an artificer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which actually, which I've done. Uh, I had a character that uh, Denny, I think, DM'd for uh, Fargrim Battlehammer. He was a cl- he was a he was a uh, Tempest cleric, huh. um, but all of his cl- all of his cleric his electrical cleric magic came from his tiny mechanical crab that he had on his on his shoulder that he named so awesome. yeah it was it was great that crab uh there was one point when we were trying to cross a river he couldn't swim so the crab so he he but he was able to float so he was just like i don't know what to do so the crab like got down to like on his head and used its claws as like a propeller to make him to bring him across the river <laughs> I love D&D so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Focusing, focusing us yeah. in a bit. Sorcerer. <laughs> so, um, so how do you guys find that you made your sorcerer characters interesting? Is there anything that you kind of like worked through or is there a commonality between 
um, your process for you, Michael, I suppose in your case, since you've played multiples. So what I usually like to do with any character in general is I like to have a theme. Um, but especially with sorcerers, if you have a, you have a theme when it comes to your spell casting. So uh, the chef character, his, his whole theme was fire magic. So all of his, so he had control flames, he had firebolts, um, but that was only part, that was only part of it. His whole thing was he was a chef. So he had pressed vegetation to be able to flavor his food. He had mage hand to be able to, to leave something uh, on the stove, but still have it moving and still keep it like cooking properly or like, or like stirring or whatever. Um, so he had, he had those cantrips and he had uh, a whole bunch of fire spells that he would use like fireball, for example, when, for when people, uh, he, he, he thought of himself as a Gordon Ramsay sort of like, he is the best in the world. He is a fantastic at his, uh, he is fantastic at, at, as a chef and uh, people loved his food. Um, but if you insulted him, you burned, <laughs> uh, which is exactly what ended up happening. Uh, he so he uh, went to he as part of like this. It was just a one. It was I think it was just a one off. Um, but he started feeding the town to try and prove to this. Uh, oh, Raksha, Rak, Rakasha, Rak, Rakshasa. Oh, Rakshasa. Yeah. yeah. Um, who was like the lord of this town? He was just like, all right, prove to me that your food is good. Um, so he went and like basically cooked for the whole for the whole town and all of them loved it um but the but the 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 priest at the church was like what are all you rabble rousers doing because he basically he made an entire town have a party um and he fed them and he ended up uh, just saying to them, oh just live a little and he, he like shoved a spoonful of soup or something into, into his mouth which he meet which the priest immediately spat out and like <laughs> he saw red and I, I and it was just like apologize and <laughs> the priest was like what apologize it's like i have ref- i will not apologize for anything then burn <laughs> oh, fireball on, into the church <laughs> oh damn yeah, and then we find out that there was a whole bunch of Mykonids and they come running out and just like on fire and just like falling down and he's just like, oh, okay, I guess this is a thing that happened. <laughs> 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 wow. Poor Mykonids. Yeah. That was a time. Um, yeah, anything, anything on your side, Soko? I think for me, I always like to think of like a quirk for the character. So whether that is like the way they cast their spells or, you know, more of a personality trait that is because of something that happens. So like with my sorcerer, I was like, okay, I don't want to just like kind of be do like the magic from a god thing because clerics kind of, you know, eat that up. That's kind of like that more their thing. So it's like, okay, what's that? something like kind of like really weird but fun that would be kind of that would be a great role play aspect as well i was like oh why not have a divine creature that i can see doing everything for me but it's not actually me doing it i have no magic of my own and um you know that's where and then i started off there and i was like okay well if i could see someone that no one else could i'd probably be paranoid and i'd probably hate people unless they were like okay you know it's fine you can just talk to your imaginary friend and that's how i end up with the people i end up with and all that but um yeah for me it all it all starts with like the quirk of how they're using their spells or what caused them to uh gain their magic that i think is the most important Mm -hmm. yeah that that's great that's great both of these are great um, yeah, actually, I agree. I agree. How they gain their magic is probably a very important aspect of how they're going to their character is going to develop. Because, say, for example, if it's a family lineage of everyone, everyone is a sorcerer, then that's going to influence what their character is going to be like versus someone who gained their magic later on in life, or someone who's own they're the only person in their family who's ever had these powers. Ver- yeah. ver- versus like someone who in their family who had 
generations before sort of deal. Yeah. And to, to take the, uh, the Xanathar's Guide to everything, because this is what we do in each of these episodes, it, what the Xanathar's Guide recommends for to, to help develop your sorcerer character is to consider the following things. Your arcane origin, which this is exactly what you guys are talking about, like where your magic comes from. Um, the reaction, and I'll elaborate a bit on that. A supernatural mark and a sign of sorcery. So I'm not going to, I won't touch on arcane origin. You guys already did that. The reaction is more about like what happened when your magic first manifested? Like, was it, when was it like, was it during your birth? So like, was there some sort of magical event, an omen or something like that? Or was it later in your life when you're just walking down the street and then all of a sudden fireball and everyone's like, whoa. Was everybody like cool or was everybody like no? <laughs> so that's actually something I don't think about particularly very often because a lot of the times I'll have a character idea and then I'll kind of forget that about how other people feel about it. I'll be like a, a very like me, me, me about, about things. And then it'll be much later on that I kind of think about like, oh, other people have thoughts about these things as well. Hmm. I, I'm I'm surprised to hear you say that, considering you've always thought of like sorcerers as superheroes. Like I think about like uh, going back to X Men and stuff like that. Like the mutants, like their powers manifest at some point. Like um, oh dear, what was the character's name? Magma or Terra or something like that. And just like Terra thing, pools of lava, and they just like are burning up. And it's just like everybody's like, whoa, whoa, hold on, what's going on? I think I think part of it is though uh, I just have the automatic assumption that people just accept it, which is definitely not the case in a lot of situations. Um, oh, although now that I think about it, Datrim, his powers, the, the his the reaction to his powers actually came about in ca in campaign, um, as like part part of it was him using his powers to be able to study magical creatures in a world where magic is basically illegal except the, for the divine the for the divine um and a lot of the time people reacted pretty poorly um uh matt matt uh costing who's been on the podcast before his character was very staunchly against magic because it, it was punishable by death and he he's just like i don't want to die for being associated with a, with a mage which is fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so there you go. There's an example where you hadn't even realized it was relevant. Uh, on, on the flip side, though, the reaction to Chef Frederick is that was one of awe because he used his powers to, it, basically like a performer. Um, the, he would travel, uh, cook, and use his magic to be able to put on a dinner and a show, essentially. Pretty sick, actually. Like a hibachi grill. Yeah, huh. yeah, ex exactly. He, he was a he, he did hibachi. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Oh, that's such a sick idea. Gotta add that to the backlog. All yep. right. Oh wow. Um. Yeah. So it's these kind of things, like because I like when developing a backstory. I like to think about like because something has caused you to become an adventurer, right? So it's kind of like. Mm -hmm. What was so significant that could have made you change the course of your life to leave your home and put yourself in danger constantly? It's like it had to have been a very significant event. That and then I think the other thing that you brought up with the Xanathar's Guide, the mark. I mm -hmm. never think about that enough with sorcerers or really a lot of classes in general, like how things might have left a mark on you or anything like that. Because that is such an important thing because if people see that you're marked. A lot of people instantly superstitious, like, yeah, we don't like you. You shouldn't be in town. Maybe you should take a little trip. Mm -hmm. Pitchforks and torches. Conversely, the mark could also be their their stop. Oh wait, no. Now that'll be sign but, of sorcery. Sign of sorcery. That's what. They, never mind. Mm -hmm. But I. Think, or it could also cause you to be worshipped, I guess, as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. There, there again, and that kind of ties back into reaction too. But the. Uh, 
the supernatural mark, like the subclass for uh, the draconic bloodline, that one's almost built in. Like you have a, a scaly appearance somewhere on your person. Like mm -hmm. it's it's built in, and that took a big part in my campaign, where like dragon sorcerers were considered evil because dragons took over the surface. So anybody who was a dragon sorcerer, they either had to go into exile or they covered up their thi their their scales and just tried to blend in with society. Sure. The, yes. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, um, I, I think a sign of sorcery that I could probably ended up having for Datrum was his uh, tattoos. Because they oh, the were supernatural they, mark. Yeah, they were alive. Like they they would often uh, le they would often leap off of his body uh, to do to do his magic. Um, and they were part of him and they were always there, always showing, except for the times when he finally decided to get, wear sleeves. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he had to hide it. Sorry. Yeah, so like things to consider with your supernatural mark. Is it like, is it something that's, uh, is it obvious or is it embarrassing? Like, do you hide it or do you proudly display it? Such as the case of Michael's characters not never wearing sleeves. Um, or Are you or... slimy? <laughs> All the time. Well, you know, that's a great point. Like, are is it only a slight oddity or is it something that is very effective? Noticeable. Yeah, very noticeable, very different. Um, do you do you play off being slimy as just being a really sweaty person, <laughs> or or um, or have you considered like does it tie in with your bloodline? Like Michael's years very much did. Um, the draconic one very much does because it's automatically there. Um, yeah. One of the things that they listed as an example is that. Um, spectral gears appear around you so for like excuse me for the uh clockwork soul it could be like uh the the gears of a clock appearing behind you as you cast your spells or like your eyes have some sort of change to them the the one i had his, he always wore goggles so you can never see his eyes but um in my mind he had gears as irises instead mm. of instead of the usual oh, that's color. so cool Years as irises, that is great. So now, to kind of point or kind of pick apart this example here, that the gears as uh, for irises, that's a supernatural mark. What you described there with the like the the gears appearing as you're casting magic, this is a great segue into the signs of sorcery. So it's like, is there something special that happens when you cast magic? So that if, for example, I throw again this fireball over there somebody can see that explosion and kind of follow it back to like, you did that. You're a sorcerer. <laughs> it's like in uh, animes when, when there's like any sort of magic user, they have like magic circles appear around them, like in fairy tale or uh, there's like a wizard barrister anime where this, like wizards are a thing, but like they have a legal team to, you know, deal with them because they, have their own specific laws that they have to follow and all that um or like uh or in the case of the owl house um whenever uh someone uses magic there they draw a circle in the air and it appears and uh, some sort of magical effect happens either from that circle or they like smack the circle into the ground and have like a fist of earth appear or something like that um or they have, or they constantly have to like keep drawing the circle to be able to concentrate on that spell. Interesting. Wow, that the Owl House is a really good show, by the way. It's a that it's would a be really cool to show concentration while you're in battle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like uh, there's one there's one character. Uh, his name's Gus. He's a, an illusionist, um, and to maintain concentration on his illusions, he ha he has like the circle in front of him, and he's like constant. He's always got like his hands moving. To keep that circle going so that the illusion can continue and do whatever it is that he needs to have happen. That is cool. Um, highly recommend. It's on Disney Plus. Uh, the first season is all is all there. Um, 
second season is currently airing and it's freaking amazing. <laughs> also, LGBT representation out the wazoo. <laughs> like, there's a lot of it. <laughs> there you go. I didn't realize it was on Disney Plus. I got to catch up on this. It's so good. Um, um, yeah, there was. A, so back to Sorcerers, though. Um, oh, actually, yeah. Owl House. Those are all sorcerers because they get their magic from the the demon world that they they all live from. Um, I just I, I could, just I could keep I could keep going. I'm not gonna. I phone. just thought there was something really <laughs> funny about. Anyway, back to sorcerers. Wait, back to Owl House. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so uh, other other signs of sorcery, like um, some of the classic examples, are like another anime example. Kamehameha, you yell oh, yes. the spell as you're casting it. Oh, everyone from freaking Dragon Ball Z is a sorcerer. Well, yes. Yeah, I mean, we've basically pinpointed any anime is almost... Like sorcerer monk. Yeah, they're sorcerer monks. Yes. Sorcerer yeah. monks. Oh, no. I've got to do a subclass now. It's got to happen. Uh, uh, all right. <laughs> Kind of taking into account other um, other senses, like uh, maybe if you're a draconic sorcerer, as you're casting your spell, your facial features begin warping into draconic elements, and your hands take like clawed talons. And then once the spell's released, you revert back to your normal appearance. Uh, Wendy, my uh, storm sorcerer, whenever she casted magic, uh, her cloak would just go billowing out from behind her, um, as like the wind the wind around her just like erupted. Um, that is a very good sign. It's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Why are sorcerers just so cool thematically, man? Because they're oh. superheroes. <laughs> True. They need. A, they all need a cloak of billowing. Yeah. Yeah. All of them. Or just the gust cantrip. That's true too. There you go. Another example I wrote down, but is probably very detrimental for a campaign, is a. Uh, Every time you cast a spell, a gong sounds. <laughs> <laughs> dong. Even so, cast uses subtle subtle spell. Yeah, yeah, gong. exactly. <laughs> oh yes, the gong. We know who that is. <laughs> um. Uh, fireball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, oh yeah, the sign of sorcery I had, I had for Daytrim was we'll keep, uh, some random animal would appear and like manifest as as the spell. Um, for example, uh, conjuration was a shark was a shark that he had had, um, and one of his spells was blade uh, was a uh, sword burst. So he fl- flavored it that uh, from the ground around around him a shark would uh, a giant shark would come up and chomp up and around Daytrim and then disappear to signify that it was like hitting everything around him, but not him. That's really cool. Um, Dude. I've got to play more <laughs> sorcerers, man. Right? <laughs> I'm putting too many ideas on the backlog already. Like, I can't. I can't, man. <laughs> I can't. Oh, boy. Um, oh, um, so the peacock was actually enchantment, I realize. And uh, if he ever ch- cast an enchantment spell, um, a, the, the, a fan of feathers would appear behind him and do the, the sort of like swaying motion that the feathers do, like the, 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 yeah. the thing. Yeah, the, yeah, people, yeah. The, the, the people listening to this as like a podcast don't see I'm trying, I'm doing basically doing a, a peacock fan spirit fingers. Yeah, the fan, oh, like, it, the tail fans out and it kind of sways back and forth. Yeah, um, when it, he had a, a, a lunar moth that he he called he called Lu, the, the moth Laven, Lavenza because of Persona Five, uh, but the the moth would like float up from his wrist and just kind of like float around, flap around him as as the illusion was being woven around. Um, I gotta go play sorcerer real quick. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be right back. I've I've got to roll some stats. Um, <laughs> some some other quick advice I would give for anybody who's trying to develop a sorcerer. Um, how do you feel about having innate magic? Like, do you love it or do you resent it as a character? Like, 
I mean, it's all a, this. Your character is basically all around this power that was giving to given to you unwillingly. Like whether you ended up in an accident or it just suddenly spawned because of something in your heritage. Like you now have this problem. Yeah, I mean, if it manifests itself in like say the magic killed your family or whatever, depending on which you know subclass you end up going into. Maybe you're trying to find a way to get rid of it because all it does is remind you of the tragedy of losing your family. Yeah. Um, kind of going back to the Elsa example from earlier, she resents her powers so much. Yeah. She hates them so much so that she locks herself away from the world for almost two decades because she's worried she's going to hurt somebody with them because she mm. already did. Um, and then when they finally do come out, they come out in the work in the worst way and um, and almost stab somebody <laughs> with just like a, a shock of ice in front of her and then she almost freezes an entire town and potentially the world who knows how far re reaching her powers could possibly be yeah i know that's important to think about because that could change your character's personality as well in general instead of just being this happy guy that you were before maybe you're not now or maybe you were depressed kind of down in the dumps you know life hadn't been going so good now you got magic. Yeah. Now you can do something, you know? Mm -hmm. Or as, as like a personal thing for me, I'm very, I in general am a showman when it comes to magic and things like that. Mostly because I, I love the idea of just being able to be big and flashy. Like that is my, that is my personal magic spell casting flavor with that. I do with most, with most of the classes that characters I play. Um, it's very rare that I'll, I'll ever play a character that resents their magic or tries to hide it. And, e and even then, when I do try to hide it, it still ends up coming out in big ways. Like with Daytrim, for example, he lived in a world where magic was punishable by death. And he tries, as hard as he tried to hide it, it still came out as a big and flashy thing. Interesting. So like it, it's something that you kind of have to, or I have to try to like balance in that respect. <laughs> something, um, but he's no. dead now, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm sorry, I wasn't there to keep you alive. Um. Yeah, there's only like a femur left of him after being eaten by a red dragon. Hey, it's enough Rough. to resurrect. Yeah, yeah, we're only like level. I think five. he has head though. Well, we'll figure it out. Um, I mean, and also going on this idea of like um, resentment or kind of leaning into it, uh, I could see like choosing one of the um, the origins and then kind of choosing the opposite of what makes sense for that origin. Like, for example, picking the shadow magic and then being like a happy-go-lucky person with all this dark power or being a storm sorcerer and just being like dreadful and serious. And so it manifests as like your lightning bolts are just straight lines. They're just straight. <laughs> like, and it's always raining around you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. So the lightning doesn't like arc or anything. It's just like just laser beams. Yeah. That could be fun too. Yeah. I, l I like the addition of that, that constant rain though. That's good. Oh. <sighs> No, I just want to play a depressed storm sorcerer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he wants to play a storm sorcerer. Ooh. Uh, now that you say it like that. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's begin wrapping this up a bit here. So why should people play a sorcerer? And do you have any critiques about the class? Do you want to be a superhero? Maybe. Do you want to have a very niche, niche abilities that uh, let you do one thing particularly well maybe uh that is i will say that is a little bit of a downside to sorcerer yes you can have a very cool themed character however uh, oh actually that might even lead into good good character character development of uh, they they're very good at one thing but they're not very good at a whole bunch of other things and it could be like okay this is why i'm with other people because i need i need help I need someone else to help me get to point from point A to point B um, in order to, you know, survive. But that is a major drawback is that you can tailor your, you can tailor your spells in such a way that you can be this cool superhero 
but then you have all these weaknesses and drawbacks that uh, come with that. So you need to be able to try and figure out how to overcome those. So that that in and of, in and of itself could lead to a very good a very good character development and later on develop into a well-rounded character. Any any critiques? Uh, Storm Sorcerer. Just uh, <laughs> waiting for it. Well, oh, all right. So, Soko, uh, your thoughts? Okay. Sorcerers. Thematically, probably one of my favorite classes. Um, just because you have so many options, especially with all the new subclasses that have come out over time. You have different ways you can choose to manifest. You have your signs, your sorcery, all that kind of cool role play. And you have tons of role play aspects that you can go into for days. My gripes with the character class is that it feels so under, I don't want to say underpowered because it is not even necessarily a power thing. It's just, it feels underappreciated. Mm -hmm. It feels like most other classes have abilities that do what sorcerers try to do better. And the only thing that really shines with the sorcerer is meta magic. But even then, a lot of those are very niche things, and you only know so many at a time as well. So it can be kind of hard to find your place in the party overall, which is why I think Divine Soul obviously is one of the more, I think it's one of the more picked uh, sorcerers just because they do have that healing aspect to them as well. So they can kind of, you know, secondary heal on the party. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, they're good class. It's just you have to be. I think you have to be really invested in your th- the thematics of it and the role play aspect to really enjoy a sorcerer. It's funny you mentioned uh, finding your place in the party because the sorcerers actually lend themselves very well to be support characters. Mm-hmm. Um, so a, a common thing that I see often uh, people talk about is uh, quick and spell, uh, quick and spell anything. Or twin spell haste. Yeah. Twin spell haste on two two on two party members. So good. As you run and hide so that you can maintain concentration on it. <laughs> yep. And it is a great is a great like support uh, option. Um, yeah. conversely, you could also go full on into the heavy hitting hard firepower and be your DPS or getting into like the more technical like aspects of, of party composition. Um, you could, you, once you figure once you figured out where your place is in the party, you can do a lot of really good things. Um, but that being, like I said before, you're going to be, you're going to be a niche. You're going to, you're yep. going to be, fill, you're going to be filling a specific spot. Um, so really, what you should do with the sorcerer is talk to your party, uh, be, ask them, okay, who, who wants to do what? And, and like say, and you can say to them, I want to be able to do X thing. And then you can figure, and then you'll be able to figure out party composition better. Yeah. I, I think it always just comes back to the wizard being this all encompassing class that can literally have a spell for every situation. Mm-hmm. Which it, it kind of just overshadows a lot of the other spellcasters, which is really unfortunate because they all have some really cool things they can do. Yeah. Um, my my um, why should people play a sorcerer? It really is about the meta magic for me. Like, are you familiar with many of the spells in D anD D? Do you not want to homebrew any additional spells? Well, pick a sorcerer and meta magic the fuck out of whatever you want because you will find new ways to fall in love with the same old spells coming this summer no it just like turns into a rom-com trailer <laughs> <laughs> you'll fall in love with these spell slots all over again but yeah no meta magic is superb like you you like michael was saying with the haste like two people haste at the same time it's absurd you haste them and then run away cuz you don't want to lose that concentration but yeah it's great uh i kind of wish the class would give more meta magic options because clearly that's mm-hmm. where the class's strength lies um and then my other critique is uh learn spells go fuck yourself <laughs> it's just a lot of swearing coming out of me at this point i'm so sorry 
I just um, really don't like learned spells. Yeah, because it, it overshadows those spells. that don't have to, right? Like the yeah. Warlock and Sorcerer, where you only have, or the, and the Bard, where you have these spells you've picked, and you're stuck with them. Yeah, sorry, I meant known spells. That's what I meant. Um, but yeah. yes, these, these things, I don't like it. I want to be able to change daily. I think ultimately, though, I agree with you about needing to know spells particularly well. Um, if if you know magic and how spells work, and what, and in in a general sense, you could play a sorcerer very well. If if you know if you know the magic, you it's 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 like a, if you know the rules, you know how to you know how to bend them. If you if you know if you know the rules, you need to know the rules before you can break them. Yep. Mm-hmm. Which which is and, funny to say, considering the class is about. I don't know how my magic works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like you don't the care the theme is chaos, and I don't know. But the the actuality is you need to know things pretty well. Well, if you want to, if you want to be effective anyway. Well, I, or you're I, not even just effective, just playing a character that you will enjoy yeah i just recommend not doing storm sorcerer for your first sorcerer i didn't enjoy it yeah if you want a good sorcerer to play as a, your first sorcerer um either draconic or shadow sorcery is is my recommendation um draconic just for the sole purpose of you get extra hp and you get extra ac and shadow because you you get cool stuff to do. Like you get, you get some like just. You get a lot of passive abilities that, as a sorcerer that just kind of happen at first level. I mean, I agree. Yeah, I agree. they do have a big first level buffs. I agree yeah. with the draconic recommendation for a first time because who doesn't like dragons? I mean, the extra protection is nice. Um, the like the flavor of being imbued by dragons is pretty cool. So. I think it's definitely a safe way to go for the first one. Uh, though I'm, I imagine a lot of people will tend to just go for the wild magic because they're like, ooh, fine. Um, but yeah, while if anything, I would actually suggest against being a wild mage as your first time, just I mean, purely because those abilities get forgotten so easily. So would I. I would as well. But um, there you go. Well, go be a sorcerer, everybody. Now, I better ask you guys mm-hmm. before I forget, on a scale of one to five, how would you rank the sorcerer class? One, you wouldn't recommend. Two, it's a boring class. Three, not your first choice, but can be fun. Four, you recommend the class. And five, sorcerers are my favorite class. Six, go play a sorcerer right now. Jeez. Breaking I barriers already. Stupid meta magic breaking my scale. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm more in the uh, 3.5 range for sorcerers, where I don't recommend it for a new player. I, I I I think you really do need to have a better grasp on spells in general to be a, a good sorcerer. Like to pick to pick the spells that you want. Yeah, because picking your spells is huge. You really need to know, hey, what do I want to do with my spell list? Yeah. And just trying to use meta magic to mess around with spells that if you don't already know how spells are generally working, it's going to be a little rough. It's going to be a high learning curve. So I don't think it's good for a newcomer, but I think for someone that's just trying to mix it up, that enjoys playing magic user, I think Sorcerer is great. Because it's almost a fun little challenge too to find, okay, what can I do with this Sorcerer? What can I push its limits to for where I want it to be in this campaign setting? So, hmm. And I'd give the class a three. I was even thinking about going at 2.5, but I'm like, uh, that did mostly be because my bias of a very bad first time. So I'm like looking at the class and like be- looking at meta magic. I'm like, man, this shit is so cool. That's going to be so fun to do. But I didn't get far enough with the character. I was a storm sorcerer, learn no- known spells. I just had a lot of gripes at the time and uh, I-, I-, I just got to give it another chance. So. I know there's fun to be had. I mean, Michael's played it six times, so it's got to be somehow good. I mean, people also... still played Rangers when they're bad, too. So, I mean, <laughs> just because someone enjoys it doesn't mean you would necessarily will. But Yeah, the, the people who play Ranger weird me out. I say as I'm currently playing a Ranger, but I'm also not the 
player's handbook rangers so <laughs> yeah uh all right well oh, man thank you guys for uh joining me for this incredibly long conversation about sorcerers now yeah. be- before we move on to our final segment of the podcast i've got a bonus question for you well i suppose this is more of a uh, a situation to set up and then a question so we're sorcerers now the three of us and but we haven't figured out how to control our powers yet so what is the one minor accident you keep causing with your magic Mine, for example, is uh, every time I take a glass, uh, I take a drink of a glass of water, the water like displaces ever so slightly and it just spills all over my shirt. I, I, I think I would be if I if I'm ever upset by things, stuff flies off shelves a lot. Mm. Um, so I would probably have to learn to to either not buy expensive things or breakable things. Or to bolt things to the ground. It's like treat your floor with like uh, foam padding. Yeah, or constantly have big squishy carpets. Uh, Lots uh, of rugs. No- nothing goes on a shelf higher than hip height. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. I don't know. That could that could aim for some low blows there. <laughs> uh, uh, like I said, nothing higher than hip height. <laughs> I think for me, it'd be like whenever I touch someone else's cell phone or my own cell phone, it'd like kill the battery and just dies randomly with no reason to it. <laughs> oh, that would suck. Oh, God. Oh. Okay, Bad. but that just also stranded. sounds like you're a storm sorcerer at that point with, <laughs> with electricity powers. Shit. So let's, let's go back about building character. Do you like the powers or do you resent them? Resent that one. Ah. <laughs> <sure>. <laughs> Oh. He, he resents them because he relates. I resent it when it's my phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Well, thank you both for indulging me on that bonus question. That was really funny. <laughs> um, that was great. So this does bring us to our final segment of the podcast. This is our chance to hear from the listeners. It's Question Dicely. So today's question was submitted by Laura K483, previous guest on the podcast, and she submitted this question on the Dicely D&D Discord server. So if you haven't yet, come hang out with us on the Discord server. We talk about D&D. Uh, there's a place to submit questions for the podcast. Um, you can talk with some of the folks who have been here if you want to, like, I don't know, just ask questions. Like, everybody hanging out with us is, like, really cool. So come come join us in that. Um, and you get to come see us be go on tangents about characters that we've played and things we've done and not just you know listen to them a, as part of podcast form you can go back and read them oh yeah or be a nerd with us yeah, yeah. we'll just talk <laughs> about things if somebody throws something out there um but i should probably get to this question so laura has asked since i'm going to try my hand at dming soon for some cl- completely brand new players they're asking me about multiclassing and some fairly complex question options, or some very ah, some fairly complex options for character creation. I don't want to limit them, and I want them to be invested in the character, but I don't want them to have a bad experience because they made a character too complex for their first time. Should I try and limit character choices for first time players or not? So we actually kind of touched on this earlier. Know the rules before you break them. Uh, my my recommendation would be to suggest to them, hey, since you're a first timer, I know you're excited, but try to keep it simple first. Do if you keep it sim- if you keep it simple, that means that they can concentrate on because there's a lot of things you got to think about in D and D. Like we went through a whole whack of things today, and like it's a lot to think about. And if you start going into multiclassing stuff and doing all sorts of cool and fancy things, you're going to end up getting a lot of stuff muddled along the way. So if they do want to multi-class super badly, sure. Okay. Um, But make sure that they understand that it might be hard and that it might take a lot of effort to try and like figure out what exactly it is that needs to be done with those characters. Um, So my recommendation would be to say, try to just keep it simple like you try to try to encourage them especially if it's only like a one shot or if it's even like i don't know if they're starting at level one 
uh, or even like level two or three, um, even just keep them at that one one class and then fourth level or even fifth level onwards, sit, sit them down and say, hey, do you, I know you mentioned you wanted to multi-class, do you wanna try and, try and figure that out now? At least that's, that's how I would go about doing it. Cause I've had, I've had people who, oh gosh, his first character was a warlock and that was just so much to explain it as it was. <laughs> um, I was also the only person there who played D and D before, and I was I was the player. I wasn't even DMing. Um, so there was a lot of times in this in that particular instance where they deferred to me and said, "Hey, what would I do in this situation?" From the DM, and I'd be like, "Well, you're the DM, so ultimately this is your call. But as per blah 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 rule, that. Um, so if you want to explain a lot of things, especially when with like different interactions with different subclasses and all that. Go for it. But otherwise, my, my my advice is just keep it simple. Uh, I think for me personally, it'd be depending on what kind of things they want to multi-class in. If they're trying to multi-class two different spellcasters, I would recommend against it because those rules can be a little different. Because they'll think, oh, I'm getting fifth level spell slots this level. Whereas, yeah, you're getting the spell slot, but you actually can't cast any fifth level spells. You're going to have to upcast other spells because you don't have access to either of those spells in your subclass, in your classes yet. Um, and trying to explain like, a lot of that can be a little difficult. As well as just some multi-classes are very hard to pull off because they don't have the same stats or you're doing a marshal and a half caster or there's a lot of like weird multi-classing rules between like half casters, full casters and melee users. Warlock. So I think it's, yeah, I would, I would try to make sure that's one of the very easy ones to pull off if it is. And if they're really excited to do it, but I mean, yeah, with first time players, the, the, you seem to make sure that they understand, okay, this is how it works and really go through with them and make sure that you both ha understand what that is going to mean for their character. Mm -hmm. I think my opinion on all this, and I don't think you guys really touched on this aspect of the question, though. This is also the DM's first time going into mm -hmm. this as well. So I oh. think considering what you know about the classes, because I've DM'd for many a first-time player, and it's often the case that they won't understand their own abilities. So if you are less familiar with all the classes that they're wanting to touch or add put their hand into the pot of, like, you got to know your classes too, because they're going to be like, uh, how does this work? And you're going to need to know that, or we'll have to stop the game, look at the book, try and interpret what it means. So I'd probably suggest if you're a new DM DMing for a new group, just, I would just say, keep it a one class. Like, let's not make this any more complicated than it is. And the more difficult we make it off the bat, the less enjoyable it risks becoming for any particular individual who might feel overwhelmed. And that could include the dungeon master in this case. So I would probably say, let's, let's just do one class per character. If you're an experienced player, go for it. I trust you know what your class does, but I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, though it, I, I do understand the hesitation of it, though, because it does feel crappy to be like, well, I don't want to I don't want to limit you guys because mm -hmm. I don't want to stifle the creativity. But like Michael was saying, learn to walk before you can run. Yeah. Yeah. And like. It isn't, it, it, you don't even necessarily need to think of it as stifling creativity. It's more, um, this is this is a, a kind of a personal thing. I enjoy when there's rules surrounding what I need to do for a creative setting. So, cause like if I'm given, if I'm set, told, okay, go, go make a character and I'm given nothing to build off of, I, and I have literally the entire universe of like thoughts and ideas and things to go off of, it's over it can be overwhelming but if there's like some sort of structure to like to go off of then that in and of itself could lend itself to be 
to be very creative. Um, like having a framework of saying, for example, you're going to be doing a heist. Everyone pick a rogue archetype. Um, or like some sort of, or tomorrow, actually, I'm going to be going to uh, watch the Perseids um, with a bunch of other, uh, a bunch of other nerds. And our theme was stargazing. And, ev and everyone had to pick a class and character that had something to do with the stars. Um, so I chose a celestial warlock because like, you know, that would be cool. Um, so one person is going with the uh, star map druid. Uh, another person is going with like a, uh, a swashbuckler who uses the stars to navigate. So like having a framework isn't necessarily a bad thing. It can lend itself to some very creative and very interesting characters that you wouldn't have necessarily have thought by yourself. Yeah, great. Does anybody have anything more they want to add on this? That's it for me. Cool. Well, uh, hopefully, Laura, that that uh, that helps with uh, with your conundrum. Um, and I guess it also depends on like the players you've got. Like you say, they're first timers, but have they done research? Like, are they very excited? Um, and by the sounds of it, they are, and they have at least they are aware of what multiclassing is. So they got to have some knowledge, kind of figure out what they know, and if they're able to hold their own. Perhaps you can trust them to carry the weight or or make that clear. I don't know much about that class, so you're going to need to be the expert on this. Um, yeah, that's all I've got. So thank you for that question, Laura. You can follow her on uh, Twitter and most social media spaces as at Laura K483. So thank you very much. And that does bring us to the end of this podcast episode. So thank you, Sokoler and Michael, for joining me on this very long conversation about Sorcerers. It was a pleasure. I always have a lot of things to say about magic. Yeah, I mean, it was awesome. And now I have way too many character ideas. Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, well, I'd like to give you both the chance to uh, plug any projects or social media for people to follow you with. So uh, where can people keep up with you? Let's start with uh, Michael. Uh, I mean, I'm on Twitter. Um, you can see my handle on the on the screen. Not the people that are listening. Oh Sorry. yes, uh, at Pishy Four is uh, what I'm on Twitter. I don't tweet very often. I'm more of the no I'm more of the normal muggle sort of person that comes on this podcast. That's friends with Denny than the actual like active social media ite. Um, uh, but I will plug that uh, you should uh, listen to the uh, Dicely uh, Dungeon, uh, oh my gosh, the Dicely D&D campaign that they've got going on every every other Saturday. Um, and it's a also, good thing I don't play, I don't pay you to plug for me. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I know. I wish I did get paid, but uh, apparently I'm just terrible at it. Well, I wish I got paid too. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. One day. All right. It's a caller. All right. Uh, I'm at Scholar underscore on Twitter. Otherwise, on other platforms, I'm just Sekolar. Uh I stream video games on Twitch. I'm dumb. I'm good at some games and terrible at most of them. So, you know, if you like that kind of thing, check it out. Um, I also am in a D and D campaign that actually starts the Sunday. I don't know when this is coming out, uh, but we start the week after. Okay, well, we start the fifteenth. Um, if you want to catch the uh, YouTube video or the VOD, we're done and select on Twitch, done and select on YouTube. Check it out; it's gonna be really awesome. I'm super excited to start this new campaign. August fifteenth. August fifteenth. Right. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It'll be after that that this comes out. Right. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. Go check out Dungeon Select. Uh, quite a few of us will likely be hanging around in the chats during their streams as well, because I love that these two little communities have kind of mashed together. I'm such a big fan of you it's guys. So much fun. Dude, <laughs> I love your guys' campaign. You guys need to do it every week. <laughs> I need more. 
Oh God, the stress in my life. Oh boy. <laughs> oh well, for the folks out there, aside from Michael already having plugged for me, I've got a little spiel of my own here. If you'd like to keep up with Speak Dicely, follow our social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch as at Dicely D and D. And if you would like to submit a question for the podcast, send an email with your question to dicelychannel at gmail.com. Or like I said before, join us on the Dicely D&D Discord server and you can sub- submit your questions there. So that's about all the time we have for this episode of the uh, Speak Dicely podcast. So thank you again, Michael and Sokola, for joining me today. This is great. Happy to be here. <laughs> Always glad to have you. So for everybody out there tuning in, Thank you for doing so, and my name is Denny, and I will be back to speak Dicely again with you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye -bye. This episode of the Speak Dicely podcast was produced and edited by myself, Denny Brandt, and the intro and outro music were created by Salik Brandt. Thank you for the support, and we'll see you next time on the Speak Dicely podcast.